an Athenite Eurondicon, Sayings of the Holy Fathers of Manathos, written by Archimandrite Ioannikios Kotsonis, translated from the Greek by Maria der Papa Mason and Sister Theodora Zion. Publication of the Holy Monastery of St. Gregory Palamas, Kufalia Thessaloniki, English edition, 1997. Translator's Acknowledgements We would like to thank several men and women, both monastics and non-monastics, who made this English edition of Anathenite Eurondicon possible. The author, Archimandrite Ioannikios Kotsonis, who blessed us, inexperienced translators though we be, to render his spiritually edifying work from its original Greek into an English translation which we hope will be accessible to as many readers as possible. The spiritual daughters of Father Ioannikios, Mother Zini, and the sisters of the Monastery of St. Gregory Palamas in Kufalia Thessaloniki, who urged, prayed for, and encouraged us in this task. To Bishop Seraphim of Ottawa and Canada, of the Orthodox Church in America, who continually encouraged us, and who, along with Peter Zion, whom we also wish to thank, helped us greatly in the last-minute computer preparations of the translated text for publishing. And Gregorios der Papas, who generously donated funds for the publication and memory of his beloved son, Werner, memory eternal. May the Most Holy Theotokos, the Lady and Protector, and Foremost Hesychist of Manathos, accept this humble offering of her unworthy servants, and may she abundantly bless all who read this narrative of the countless brave monks who have struggled spiritually in her holy garden and of the innumerable glorious miracles which have occurred there during the past thousand years. Signed, Maria der Papa Mason and Sister Theodora Zion, Kingston, Ontario, Canada, July 1997. Author's Acknowledgements for the English Edition in our era, a thirst for orthodox sources of wisdom from the Holy Fathers is very apparent and universal. The prophetic words of the English Byzantine scholar Runkeman that the 21st century would be the century of orthodoxy are beginning to come true already, as so many of the orthodox books are now being translated into various languages of the world. This translation of the Athenite Eurondicon aims to acquaint the English-speaking reader with the little-known grandeur of Hagiorite hesychistic monasticism, that pride and glory of the Church, and of both Orthodox and non-Orthodox people alike. We wish to express our sincere thanks to the co-translators, Dr. Presbytera and now Sister Theodora Zion and Mrs. Mary Der Papa Mason of Canada for their scholarly and theologically exact translation of the text. We also wish to express Heartfelt thanks to Maria's sister, Dionysia der Papa, for her help and support. And finally, we thank especially Maria's and Dionysia's brother, George der Papa's artist and iconographer, who donated the funds to make the publication of this English edition possible. Signed, Archimander Ioannikios. Prologue. In practicing the gospel's virtues of fasting, vigilance, and prayer, our Holy Fathers were granted spiritual gifts from heaven. Observing the examples of their lives, we are called to imitate their faith. All the saints' practices resulted from their faith and trust in God. In part, their spiritual struggles are also acts of faith. With self-denial and trust, they dedicated their lives to Christ. They had no will of their own, no rights, but embraced the divine will of God and His judgment. They toiled and they shed sweat and tears. They endured temptations and slander. They died to the world and they were reborn in God. Divine and exceptional gifts were granted to them, and so they were given eternal life by God's grace. From the early beginnings of the church, those who loved God and wished to imitate holy men and follow in their footsteps needed as prototypes the deeds of the apostles and saints. The Holy Fathers left behind the sacred inheritance of the lives of these saints, which are the words of the gospel lived out in action. When we read these accounts, our zeal for God is revived. We are consoled in sorrow. We are made courageous in temptation. We are taught philosophy in action. And finally, we are uplifted to heavenly visions. Moved by this same spirit, 
the Reverend Archimandrite Ioannikios has edited and published the Eurondikon. In a simple style, with clarity and grace, he presents the spiritual lives of these martyrs, our fathers of Manathos. And so by having before us such a multitude of saints and putting aside our sinful ways, let us run the race before us with patience, looking up to the leader and perfecter of our faith, our Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews 12, 1-2 It is clear that the tradition of spiritual struggle continues to this day on Manathos with the blessings of Our Lady the Theotokos who protects and guides those entrusted to her. We hope and pray that this Athenite Yerondikon will contribute toward the revival of zeal and love for God in those who read it. Signed Archimandrite George Higuman of the Holy Monastery of St. Gregory on Manathos. Introduction Side note The reader asks your forbearance, patience, and forgiveness for mispronunciations of various difficult to pronounce Greek terms. Those who study the great monastic life on Manathos and the accomplishments of the brave monks there who have defended the church realize that these guardians of our faith are like the ancient ascetics of Egypt, Mount Sinai, Palestine, and Syria, who thirsted for salvation, sainthood, and the most perfect ascetic way of life. The Athenite monks are equal to those fathers of the East in their self-control, considering the climactic conditions on Athos, with severe winters and the surrounding sea. In contrast, the countries of the East, which have warm and dry climates, favor more extreme and longer periods of fasting. It has been rumored that monks came from the Theban de Egyptian desert to Katanakia on Manathos, but were unable to endure the climate, so they left behind their Katunia, and the area was named Katunakia. The Eastern Orthodox spirit of evangelical apostolic Hezekiah and solitude as exemplified by the New Testament, was passed on through Egypt and Palestine and Constantinople, Bithynia and Mount Athos. The Orthodox ascetic tradition is the same as that of the Gospel, for the Bible virtues and asceticism are identical as observed in the Lord's and His Apostles' lives. This tradition is hesychistic, philosophical, and philocalic. It seeks the kingdom of God within us and aims to restore the original state of sinlessness through the purification, illumination, and deification of man by grace. And finally, this tradition is one of thanksgiving and prayer and deals with the ultimate destiny of humankind. On Manathos, God's presence is experienced daily in the holy mystery of the Eucharist and in the Jesus prayer. In the divine liturgy, God's uncreated energies are experienced mystically, actually, and in truth. The work at hand was originally conceived in response to the desire of my respected and ever-memorable spiritual father, who frequently asked me to collect material, urging me to visit various ascetics, hermits, abbots, subordinate monks, and communities in order to compile notes and write a holy mountain Eurondikon. At the same time, he and I together drew information from his experiences and memories. He himself was a monk of Manathos, from the holy skeet of St. Anne. Even though for reasons beyond his control he had to abide elsewhere, his mind and heart were forever set on his beloved Athos, for he talked always about its mysteries, history, and Byzantine grandeur. While my spiritual father narrated, my beloved brother, Archimandrite Daniel Guvalis, and I kept notes, and two publications were prepared. The series, Contemporary Athenite Profiles, and the book, Memories from Panagia's Garden. Other respected persons who were contacted for this publication were the Abbot Gabriel of Dionysiu, the grandfather, Abbot Vasarian of Grigoriu, Archimandrite Andreas of St. Paul's, the ever-memorable Elder Eurontios of the Danalite community, Elder Michael the Kafso Kalivitan, Theodosius of St. Paul's, Father Athanasios the Iveritan, 
Elder Lazarus, the Dionysian, Damaskinos of St. Basil's, Elder Theophylactos, the Kafsokalivitan, Christodoulos, the Katunakian, Modestos, the Constamanitan, Dionysius, the Cartsonitan, the elders Arsenios, Joachim, and Bartholomew from St. Anne's, Elder Chrysanthos from St. Anne's, and Paulos, the physician from Lavra. Significant information was also given by the following contemporary fathers, Theocletos of Dionysiu, the Danelites, Thomsonites, Yerasimites, and the Carsonians, Father Ephraim from Katanakia, Father Paisios from Panaguda, Elder Eurasimos the hymnographer, Father Porphyrios the Kafsokalivitan, Father Eudokimos from Vatopedi, Father Simeon from Simonopatra, Elder Achilios from St. Anne's, Father Maximus the Iveratan, Father Anthimos from St. Anne's, and Elder Miletios and Elder Macarius from Nuski. For this difficult undertaking, and in order to describe authentic and genuine incidents, we tried to cross-reference the information given either among the contemporary living fathers with the written accounts we had or from one written document to another. Whenever we came across something obscure or not clear, we noted by saying, it has been rumored or they say. The life events and the accounts of the fathers are presented as simply as possible, briefly and with accuracy. Our desire has been to follow the style of the ascetic story of the old Yerondikon and Lafseakon, a style which is indigenous to our orthodoxy, whether in words or images, for indeed whether one is reading the sayings of an ascetic or standing before a Byzantine icon, he experiences the same deep feeling which transmits spirit and life, grace and inner strength, without worldly colors and shapes or any other ornaments and additions. The sayings of the elders, like the Byzantine icon, are not exaggerated. They are direct, deep, plain, real. They are truth itself. In gathering the materials for the publication at hand, and to complete the gaps of our own notes made from recollections of past and present fathers and of fellow monks, we referred to all books and periodicals available on the ascetic struggles on Manathos, and in copying passages from the biographies and recollections of holy men who labored and excelled on Athos, we found it expedient to clarify that the Athenite tradition is continued even to this day as the citadel of asceticism for orthodoxy. We should also add that Athos is often called Panagia's garden. Like all gardens, it is full of many varieties of flowers of different colors, shapes, and fragrances. Many and in great variety are the gifts bestowed upon the fathers, but the source of these spiritual virtues is one and the same, the divine grace of the Holy Spirit. As for the thorns, no one can doubt their presence. They are always there, representing human failures. But who can pay attention to the thorns and ignore the blossoms. The worker bees always prefer the flowers. It is hoped that the present work, by God's grace and the blessing of all past and present fathers of Athos, may be a deterrent to the increasing danger of worldliness, change, and deterioration of the Orthodox monastic tradition. There is always the danger that monasticism may become easy, whereas by its nature and position it should follow the narrow path, which is ridden with difficulties. Its beauty may be defiled by lack of hard work and deprivation, and its beauty and dignity eliminated by adding rather than taking away the comforts of life. By contrast, true monks cling to the discipline of depriving themselves of material things. The world suffers from the mania of collecting more and more possessions. Such is the goal of contemporary man, and as a result he accumulates misery upon misery. Such blinded men, in gaining more material things, are entangled in a vicious cycle of concerns, stress, and despair. As an epilogue to the Eurondikon, we thought it best to give praise to the fathers of Athos, a palatable ending, 
so that our unskillful writings may become a tasteful experience to the reader. We believe that this Athena Yerondikon should be available at a level suitable for both our contemporary fathers and the lay people who live in the world, for those living in the 20th century and those who will live in the 21st. This work will, we also hope, be a connecting link to the chain of our tradition, a tradition which in this world can become the guiding light in the darkness of our times. It was our lot, humble and unworthy, to deal with such a difficult task, surpassing our ability. In the future, someone more gifted, more experienced, both in writing and in virtue, may present us with a better work with fewer shortcomings for the glory of God and the benefit of souls. This is our most profound desire. Signed, Archimandre Ioannikios. Chapter 1. On Christ-like Love When finally St. Athanasios had built Lavra's holy monastery, he traveled to Constantinople. He wanted to see his spiritual child, Emperor Nikiforos Phokas, who had promised that he would leave the world and become a monk near his spiritual father, and had already sent much gold to St. Athanasios for the monastery's construction. As soon as the emperor heard of his arrival, he could not contain his joy. He changed his imperial garments and went to meet the holy man as an ordinary citizen, kissed his hand respectfully, embraced him, and led him to the royal quarters. How the emperor was moved by the saint's love. I know, my father, he said, that I am responsible for all your troubles, I have put aside the fear of God, and I have violated my promise to him. I beg you to have mercy on me and await my return, God willing. The holy man was comforted by the emperor's words, but he knew that Nikiforos Phokas would not be able to fulfill his promise. Yet, in the face of such repentance, one ought to show love. The saint forgave the emperor and admonished him to live simply and humbly and to repent every day, asking God's mercy on his transgressions. Holy Eurondios, the first inhabitant of St. Anne's Hermitage, was taught by the Lady Theotokos the measure of her son's exceeding love. Therefore he reached, through divine love, a state of being humble, tranquil, and free from any love of material things. He had only one care, to keep God continually in his mind, and to be a good example to his disciples. In the holy monastery of Philotheu lived an ascetic, the holy martyr Cosmas the Aetolian, equal to the apostles. Being prompted by deep love and divine revelation, he assumed the cross of apostolic mission to preach the gospel to the Greek nation, having the blessings of the elders and the patriarch of Constantinople. He performed numerous miracles and spiritually resurrected our demoralized nation. At the end, he received the crown of martyrdom. We suffer because we have no love. He who does not love has no peace, even if they were to put him in paradise, said an elder. Father Ilarion of the Holy Monastery of Simonopetra, whose obedience it was to nurse the sick, never went to sleep if any of the other fathers were ill. He wasn't entirely self-sacrificing in his care of his patients. Using his prayer rope, he prayed all night long, pacing up and down, Lord, have mercy upon your servant, and holy unmercenary physicians intercede for this servant of God. He also went fishing for his patients, after which he would cook his catch for them in an attempt to help them become stronger and feel better. The ever-memorable Simon the hermit of St. Anne's, devoted himself to the service of the sick and elderly. His small monastic cottage or hut, his cell, was dedicated to the feast of the purification, had no water nearby. He toiled constantly, making wooden kitchen utensils to sell in Keriez, where he always went on foot. He died in 1933 at the age of 69. At one time, some monks of Nuskeet cleaned up the area where the bones of the reposed fathers were kept. An elder by the name of Daniel, who lived in the fort of the Skeet and served everyone with no complaints, 
once while helping on the clean-up team, addressed the reposed, saying, You struggled while living on the earth, so you have received your laurels and found your place in heaven. Pray for us, holy fathers. Then a voice was heard coming from the heap of bones. You must have love. No one can be saved without having love. An elder said, We are Christians, but no one keeps the commandment of love your neighbor as yourself. There were some monks, brave both in body and spirit, who were consumed by the virtue of love. Nothing could stop them, neither hard work nor the danger of contracting infectious diseases while taking care of their sick brothers. Father Pendulaman from St. Anne's was such a hero. He devoted himself to the service of others. He nursed those afflicted with tuberculosis, fed the starving during the incredible hunger of the German occupation, and finally died in 1948 after having contracted the disease himself, all without uttering any complaints. Instead, he always gave praise to God. Ignatius from Chios, a monk of St. Anne's, gained distinction not only during our country's wars, especially in the Balkans, but also for his efforts in striving for love and charity. On his arrival at the hermitage, he built a hut by the seashore in honor of the Lord's birth. There he offered hospitality to everyone, especially to the shipwrecked. He risked his own life helping many New Zealanders and British soldiers escape. All the fish he caught he would give to the destitute and persecuted. He died when he fell off a cliff in 1947. They found him holding his forehead with a cross in his mouth. Another charitable fisherman was Father Sophronios from St. Anne's, who lived in a hut below Lovrarchia. At first he had gone to the monastery of Lavra, wanting to be tonsured a monk there, but he came back unsuccessful. Satan then attacked him by deriding him and saying sarcastically, You went as Spiros and returned with the same name, Spiros, that was his secular name. But he refused to despair. He returned to the monastery, was tonsured, and began to live the angelic life. He lived completely destitute, but he had a great deal of love in him. He gave away all the fish he caught to the poor fathers. He reposed when he was ninety years old. Isaac, the Dionysian, while praying unceasingly, forgot to go to sleep, particularly at night. He devoted his prayers to the health and salvation of the workmen in his holy monastery, often in tears and anguish in his loving heart. For a while he stayed on the upper floor of the monastery's metokion. The workmen could hear him praying out loud, wailing, and saying, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, be merciful to the workmen. Give them their daily bread and bless them, for they are working so hard to get their daughters married off and to help their children complete their education. An elder said, Sometimes we say we have love, but what kind of love is it? What I mean is, what kind of spiritual love? For I am not referring to worldly love. How can any man reach the state of considering all mankind as his brothers and sisters? Perhaps some of these people are heathen or Jehovah Witnesses, yet nonetheless they are brothers in the flesh, though not of course in spirit, as the Orthodox are to one another, but they are still blood brothers. We ought to shed our tears for them as well. In another instance, if an Orthodox were to become a Jehovah Witness or a Catholic, how I would weep. Now there are millions like them. Have I wept enough? No, and therefore I am far from having true love in me. There once was a hermit, well known to all the caves of the Athenite Peninsula, who had a bright and joyful face. He would put out a cup to gather water and would wait twenty-four hours for it to be filled. Such was his patience and perseverance. His wish was to die on the day of the elevation of the Holy Cross, celebrated on the 14th of September. For the fathers say that on that day there is no examination of the souls on the ascent to heaven. He was totally poor. He owned nothing, but his soul was adorned with Christ-like love. If he knew of someone who was sick somewhere, 
he would gladly go to look after and serve that person. He was always ready to help, serve, and care for the elderly. He had nursed 15 elderly and sick hermits. O oh, man of God, you were truly an imitator of the Lord. You became a zealot and followed Christ's example of washing his disciples' feet. Elder Gideon from the monastery of Lavra became simple Paul II. As he watched an airplane flying over, he was observed, praying. What are you doing there, Father Gideon? Well, I am praying, using my prayer rope, he would answer in a simple manner, so that no plane will crash and all the people traveling will reach their destination unharmed. The charitable elder Harlambos from Nuskeet was bedridden with a very serious illness. He was visited by Father K. How are you getting along, Father? asked Elder Harlambos. Well, Yerunda, with your blessing. Do you have food? I have some dried bread, he said, and with some effort he got up, stretched his thin legs as much as he could, and took from the shelf a loaf of the bread. Take it, my brother and father, and pray for me. This action strengthened me, Father K. said later, and it remained fresh in my memory for the rest of my life. He was wrestling with death, yet the care for his brother took precedence over his own mortal struggles. An elder said, We will cry over the ruins of our skeet, for love doesn't exist there. So much money, give a bit to a poor person, so that you will be building a little hut in heaven. Elder Avakam was a disciple of love. Once, with much self-denial, he kept in his hut a youth infected with tuberculosis, looking after him for many months. Joyfully he nursed him, caring for him like a loving mother. Even though he himself was fasting, he nourished his patient with meat and other nutritious foods. He struggled hard with the young man's affliction, and the youth finally died in his arms after repenting and confessing his sins. Before the young man's repose, the elder tonsured him a monk, giving him the name Fanurios. Another time, some pilgrims found Father Avacum in his hut crying. When they asked him what the matter was, he told them that shortly before their arrival, some visitors had told him about some blind children who were suffering in the world, and he could not hold back his tears. His was a true affection, unselfish and practical. Rightfully, it has been said about Elder Avakum. One sure thing about this man, he attracted his fellow men toward him like a healing fountain. Elder N gave away everything he had. This ever memorable monk had as his motto, God loves the cheerful giver. A charitable, charitable group of five brothers of St. Anne's Skeet would fill up the sacks of any fathers who came for the vigils with lemons and oranges picked from their orchard. And again, some other fathers would gather vegetables from their gardens and put them out near the paths of the skeet, which were most frequently used by monks, pilgrims, and workmen, so that all might freely share the father's charity, taking whatever was needed. In faraway paths even to this day, next to several prayer stands, one might find a little bread and olives to be used by any tired traveler. It is a continuation of the Athenite hospitality in Panagia's garden, where the monks see in every visitor Christ himself. This is in accordance with his word. I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. And inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Matthew twenty-five, twenty-five to 40. St. Agapios, the worthy laborer, led an ascetic life at Kutlumusius Skeet, near the holy monastery of Vatopedi. He was captured by the Turks, and after twelve years in captivity, was freed miraculously by the Lady Theotokos and returned to Manathos to his elder. The elder reprimanded him for secretly leaving his cap captivity. The holy Agapios obeyed him, returned, and by his virtue and holiness, persuaded the Turk and his two sons to come to the holy mountain where they were baptized and became monks. The words of our contemporary wise father Athanasios the Iverton, Melufilus, loving and filled with the desire for God, 
are echoing in my deafened ears, awakening my in insensitive heart. Heavenly pleasure and enjoyment beyond this world come the moment any man contemplates the mystery of the divine plan of God's incarnation. For the salvation of mankind through the Virgin Mary Theotokos, Jesus and Mary, Mary and Jesus, these two most wonderful names, that is paradise. The Lord brought me down from the plane of mystical visions to the level of the practice of the virtues, an obedient monk once said. He had been caring for his aged, senile elder who was suffering from prostate infections. The elder had uncontrollable urination, which kept his disciple awake all night long. Another one said, Our love should be brotherly love to relatives or strangers alike. On the treacherous Kurulia lived a Russian ascetic, Father Zosimas, a man of perfect love. He looked after the sick and gave a helping hand anywhere it was needed. During the war he fed many hermits by making baskets and selling them. Father Gabriel of Nuskeet said, even though a man participates in the holy mysteries daily or gives away all his possessions to charity and reduces himself to skin and bones from fasting and doing many prostrations, he will not have God's mercy unless he has God-like love. That is why St. Paul, the great apostle to all the nations, when praising love, said, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become as sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. 1 Corinthians 13.1 150 years had passed since the holy Yerentz, the builder of St. Anne's Skeet, lived, when a giant of asceticism, the elder Damaskinos, came to spend his ascetic life in a dreary hut on the north side of the Skeet. He was one of the strongest pillars of the Skeet in the 16th century, and he never consumed anything but dry bread and water. His prayers were were of rare warmth, love, and sympathy for the entire world, and his love burned like a candle. He would pray like this, Lord, make all idolaters, unbelievers, atheists, and heretics to repent and learn the truth and to believe in you, to become one flock with one shepherd, and to glorify you, the only true God in Trinity, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, so that no one will be left out of heaven, my Lord. Frequently he would go into ecstasy and have visions of great mysteries and thus be filled with divine joy and thanksgiving. The time my ever-memorable elder decided to write Memories of Panagia's Garden, he was ill and not able to write it himself. But when there was some free time, unforgettable moments for me, he would narrate and I, the least of all, would compile what he said with a blessing. We wrote about his brother monk, Stephanos, who was the last one remaining from their synodia. We corresponded and were received as guests frequently in his hermitage hut. We did not have a pack animal to transport our loads, my elder said. Nonetheless, we had the blessed pack carrier of love, whose name was Stephanos. Most of the time, while carrying on his back an oversized pack as he was climbing from the dock up to the hill, he uttered the Jesus prayer out loud. The fathers at the skeet knew that Father Stephanos was coming, for they could hear the well-known sound of his voice. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Frequently, while conversing with someone, he would repeat out loud in a simple manner the same prayer, regardless of whether or not he had put the person he was with in an awkward situation. Being a Spartan, he had a harsh and awkward manner, forward and solemn. A severe monk, you would say, if you had not known him well. However, he had an unbelievably sensitive heart, full of compassion for the poor. On Monathos, personalities are straightened out, becoming simpler. Masks of social politeness and pretentiousness, courtesy, are removed. These personalities are sanctified in the fountain of spontaneous love that is not found anywhere else in the world. I will never forget Father Stephanos's love and self-denial. He would always wear the most inexpensive clothing, and he would do the heaviest jobs and eat the worst food. He would collect the leftover food from the day before, put it in a bowl, add a bit of water, and eat it quietly. Often Elder Paisios 
would say to him jokingly, Hey, old man Stephanos, do you remember the nice meals we enjoyed in America? We ate like kings, and now you're eating this watered-down food? He would nod agreeably, almost with indifference, emptying the bowl with pleasure as if he were eating a gourmet meal. His hut to him was like a little palace in heaven, surpassing the skyscrapers of America in comfort and in happiness, and his food was the best in the world. When he became ill with cirrhosis of the liver, we visited him in his her hermitage. We would find him sleeping on a table. We offered to take him to Thessaloniki for therapy, but he adamantly refused. If our Panagia wishes for me to be cured, that is fine, whatever she likes. And anyway, she wants it. But I am not leaving Athos, he answered. This ever-memorable monk was hard on himself, yet so kind to his brothers. His enormous pack displayed the struggles of his charitable heart as he traveled on foot through rocky, desolate places, bringing food and medicine to the destitute hermits. Often enough, when he used a mule for transportation, it was during the night, so that his virtue might not be known. My elder told me, once there was an old man in St. Anne's Skeet named Father Petros. He was ninety-five. He used to sit in the open space in front of the skeet mending socks for some of the fathers there. In doing this, he was discreet, keeping in mind what the Bible says. But when you do charitable deeds, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Matthew 6, 3. An aged and needy ascetic said to his neighbor, Come, my brother, and see what kind of love the fathers have. I find bread fruit, cheese, and fish that they left here for me, exactly what I have been needing. Praise God, our Panagia provides for everything. To pray for the world is as if you are shedding blood, St. Siloanos of Manathos said, and again, our brother is our life. Elder Avakum had the characteristic of spontaneous deep love which is so often found on Manathos. He served as an infirmitan, in the holy monastery of Lavra. Days, nights, months, and years, summer and winter, Elder Avakam spent his time over the wash tub, washing the clothes gladly and without complaint for the sick brothers and for many lay people in need. He went back and forth from the wash tub to the kitchen, preparing meals, feeding the sick, and providing them with fresh clothes so that they would always be clean. I was privileged to meet and know Elder Modestos, a member of the monastic community of Kotstomanitu, a tireless scholar of divine love. All his discussions were centered on love, the axis of spiritual life. Frequently, he would say, unless we feel that all mankind are our brothers and sisters, and that we are their brothers and sisters as well, the Holy Spirit will never dwell in our hearts. The Lord loves everyone the same the biggest sinner, and the most holy man. In the same way, we should embrace everyone in our hearts. Love tolerates, gives in, and endures. God is love. An elder said, Anyone who loves God loves not only his fellow man, but the entire creation as well. Trees, grass, flowers. He loves everything with the same love. The brothers of Nuskeet have told me that the elder Neophytos from the time he became a monk to the time he died in peace, remained in Panagia's garden for 65 years without ever leaving even once. This ever-memorable monk practiced love toward everyone as a virtue higher even than the virtues of solitude and renunciation of the world. Because of this, he loaded himself with the pilgrim's luggage, carrying it from the dock to the main part of the monastery. Chapter 2 on purity of the senses and the heart. An elderly ascetic told us, any monastic who ventures out into the world should be extremely careful when conversing with people. This is particularly true of female monks who need experienced spiritual fathers to tell them how to maintain the purity of their senses. Father Neophytos was the spiritual father of little St. Anne's. He occupied the hermitage of the holy archangels, the place where St. Agapios had lived and written The Salvation of Sinners. At one time, Father Neophytos had gone to the island of Tinos in order to serve 
as the celebrant priest in one of the mo women's monasteries there. In this community, all the nuns were attempting to live a pure life. One of them, who was blind, went to confession to Father Neophytos and revealed the impure thoughts which she had had about him. He was so dismayed that he immediately returned to little St. Anne's. He was sad and puzzled. How could Satan introduce such thoughts to a blind person? He decided one day to invite answers from all the neighboring spiritual fathers. He discussed the questions with Father Stephanos, Kiprianos, and Cosmas, and with a subordinate sent by Father Ignatius, who, although the most experienced of them all, happened to be ill at the time. His subordinate's name was Ignatius also. He was from Ishmirin and had the desire to be a monk from a very early age. All the elders started to discuss this issue. How could a blind nun be tempted by improper thoughts? But though they were spiritually mature, they were unable to resolve the question. Then the turn of the young father Ignatius came. Your voice, father, became the cause of such thoughts to the blind nun, thoughts which she reflected upon and then went to confess. All the fathers were impressed with his answer and blessed his words. An elder said, Monk, beware, do not extend your hand to any woman, not even your own mother, so that you can attain the spiritual heights of our forefathers. Pay attention when you are in the world. Restrain from laughing and joking, so that while conversing, your teeth may not be seen. When you observe all these practices, the purity of your life will teach you higher things. In 1955, a miracle occurred to a brother from Dionysiu, the appearance of St. John the Baptist to him. We were told of the occurrence by the ever-memorable Elder Lazarus. He was talking as if it were of a third person, but we realized that it was really about him. A brother from the monastery who was sent to Thessaloniki stayed in a hotel where he was unwillingly tempted. A pretty young woman approached him a family acquaintance, asking him questions about the fathers and the holy mountain. The discussion went on for a long time, and her intention became clear when she offered him hospitality in her room, extending her hand to him, saying, We'll be going just for a moment, and we'll return right away. His fall would have been actualized if at that moment he had not been protected by his prayer to and trust in St. John the Baptist. He pleaded for the saint to intercede and save him from such a pitfall. And indeed, a sudden blinding light shone in her room, and in the midst of it appeared St. John, who snatched him up and returned him to his room at the opposite end of the hotel floor. An elder said, A good man views all women as if they were his own sisters. Even when he sees an immoral woman, he should say to himself, if this woman were my blood sister, I would be very embarrassed. Then he would not have taken advantage of her. The enlightened father Joachim, from St. Anne's, who was like a brother to our elder, said, Whoever desires to be pure, let him be careful, strict, and watchful of himself, not even holding his own hands together. In gatherings he should be careful about how he talks and looks around, and avoid contact with handsome people, and anything else which might connect him to a fall from chastity and purity of life. For our contemporary, Father Yosef the Hezekist, relentless was the war against the flesh. This war lasted eight years, which is a long time for someone who had remained pure of any carnal sins since childhood. He would say that whenever he was reaching the point of exhaustion in the struggle, he would start all over again after being strengthened by God's grace. But for him, as time passed, the war was intensified almost endlessly. At the same time, I did not give up my defense tactics, which were all-night vigils and self-inflicted beatings. I wept, sighed, and prayed to Our Lady of Theotokos. The struggle slowed down for a while so that I would catch my breath and then it started all over again more intensely than before. My body got weaker, and I lost my strength. 
I was consoled only in prayer, and that was a comforting sign. He mobilized all practical methods for a victorious ending of the struggle, such as all-night vigils, hardship, hunger, thirst, beatings, and tears. He gave up his bed and slept sitting on a wooden stool, made into an armchair to rest his arms. He did this for the duration of the entire war. Chapter 3 on Unknown Saints and Hermits In the Kiriakon, the main church of Kafso Kalivia, there is a mural of an unknown saint with the inscription, Sanctified Euphrosinos of the Monastery of Ivron, who has passed away. On his right hand, he is holding an unfolded scroll, which is inscribed, Having a simple heart and living amidst turmoil, he has slept in the Lord. He is wearing a monk's tunic, kneeling in prayer. The biographer of St. Akakios, the Kafsokalivitan, Father Jonas, at the end of his works, writes about the holy martyrs contemporary with St. Akakios. These martyrs are like precious jewels departed to the Lord. Such was the blessed Euphrosinos, who shone like another sun in the holy monastery of Iveron. Because he had a simple manner and was clairvoyant, he would speak figuratively and be capable of re revealing anyone's hidden inner state of being. His relics were not found in the tomb on the day set aside for the translation. And still living on Manathos are monks like him. The elder Yermanos, who did his ascetic labors near a Romanian elder in Charai, one night dreamed of three worthy elders who said to him, Be careful, we three are staying here. Do not disturb us and tell the others not to bother us either. Father Yeromanos told this revelation to his famous spiritual father, Neophytos the Caramelian, who labored on the Carmelian mountain on a peak west of Kerasia in St. Basil's desert. Father Neophytos searched persistently with great zeal and desire in all the caves and deserted hermitages of the area but could not find the holy relics of the hermits. Soon after, the three deceased ascetics revealed themselves to the Romanian elder like this. Once, as he was going toward St. Nilos's cell to receive Holy Communion, he smelled a holy fragrance, as many other Holy Fathers had previously done, including the present writer, unworthy and least of all as he is. This particular time, However, the pious ascetic, Father Neophytos, had the very strongest sense of the fragrance, so he decided to search for its source and prayed to the saints to show him where their holy relics lay. There was a ledge at that location. As he put aside the rocks with which the ledge was built, behind the pile of stones he saw a cave opening. It was from this place that the fragrance of myrrh was coming. He attempted to enter the cave, but was startled by a voice which said, Do not disturb us. We are three. We used to live here. We do not wish anyone to disturb us. The kind and pious elder blocked the opening of the cave and left, praising God and those obscure saints, rare desert lilies of the holy mountain. He revealed the opening of the cave only to his disciple, Ilarion. The Romanian elder Eurasimos, who recounted this story, lived on Manathos for 40 years. Many years ago, in the hut below the central church of Kafsokalivia, a novice from Bulgaria named Yakovos was in training under obedience to a very strict Greek elder. Yakovos wished to lead a greater ascetic life, and for this reason would come at night to the narthex of the church to pray beneath the icon of the Holy Trinity. One night during a full moon, while he was praying, he heard the footsteps of a man. He carefully hid himself. Then he saw the man entering the narthex, naked and with a long white hair and a very long beard. The man blessed the door of the church, which had opened by itself with the sign of the cross. He went into the church, venerated the icons, and then exited, blessing the door again with the sign of the cross as it shut itself by divine power. Then he began to go uphill, taking the path from the skeet toward Kerasia. 
The novice Yakovos, overwhelmed with admiration and curiosity, followed this unknown hermit quietly, step by step. Soon they reached the location of the cross, made a right turn, and following one behind the other, taking the path leading to the top of Athos. When the hermit reached the church of Panagia, the novice quickly quickened his step and jumped in front of him, making a prostration and pleading with him to receive him under obedience. "'You cannot stay here, my son,' the unknown hermit replied. Yakovos insisted, wetting the ground with his tears. "'Return to your elder. Be obedient, and you will be saved. No one can endure this place without having divine grace, and you should also know that you will soon die. Yakovos went back, told his elder all that had happened, went to his confessor, prepared himself for his departure, and three weeks later fell asleep in the Lord. It has been said that during the translation of his relics, a fragrance was sensed coming from them. It was fifty years ago when the following event took place. A devout pilgrim from Crete started out to visit Manathos, to see his cousin, Father Euthemios, a hesychist who lived in a hut situated on the southern end of the monastery of Little St. Anne's. From the dock of St. Anne's, he started walking through unfamiliar paths, rocky cliffs and ravines, until he reached the location called Hunger. There was a dead end. He was forced to continue by climbing up, until finally, with great difficulty, he reached the hesychist's place of the archangels, the location where the Cretan Agapios Landos wrote The Salvation of Sinners. From that point he reached his relative's hut. When he had caught his breath and after such an adventure was received with hospitality, he said to Father Euthemios, Cousin, tell me, when you, when you are going to bury the body I saw up there on the cliffs in the cave, I would like to witness how a burial is done on Marathos. When Father Euthemios heard about the dead man in the cave, he, along with his cousin and the elder Kiprianos, the goldsmith, started to search the entire area, inch by inch. But they did not find anything. Only around sunset did they smell a fragrance of incense coming from the direction of the cliffs, an aroma which Father Kiprianos had smelled before. In the meantime, the pilgrim told his story. Next to this tree was the cave, I entered, and there, on his deathbed, a reverend elder was sleeping. In the beginning, I did not realize that he was dead. Then I came closer and saw that he had a cross on his head. Next to him was an icon of the Mother of God and a lit lamp. I crossed myself, bowed three times, and smelled incense. I left thinking that you had no time to bury him that day. In the year 1977 to 1978, the Dikeos, the term used the, the prior of the Skeets, the rank just below the abbot, of St. Anne's Skeet was monk Kirill. During the month of September, he received as a guest a Lebanese Orthodox Christian, a refugee to Greece because of the war in Lebanon. This devout Lebanese had a strong desire to climb to the top of Athos. So early in the morning, with directions given by, by this man, he began his long and exhausting ascent. On the same day during the evening, he returned to the Skeets Kiriakon. The following day after the Divine Liturgy, he was able, with the little Greek he knew, to relate the following marvelous incident. In the location known as Babila, below the mountain peak, where the great slope begins, he stopped to rest for a moment and then continued climbing. While he was searching for a place to rest, suddenly he saw in front of him a house out of which two venerable hermits came. As soon as they saw him, they welcomed him and gave him fresh figs, which had a fifth flavor and sweetness that he found impossible to describe, and cool water. His fatigue disappeared completely. He also saw ten more respectable monks in the hut, each of whom was leaning on a curved, lazy stick and praying with a prayer rope. They replied to his questions that they had been living there for a long time and did nothing else but pray for the entire world. All these things and more filled the pilgrim with astonishment and admiration. He said that they were all of the same age. When the 
The Dicaeos and the others heard they were surprised and gave praise to God for his wonders through his saints. In the area between the great Lavra and Kafso Kalivia, a long time ago there lived an aged monk named Panaratos. At one time he decided to start a garden in front of his hut in order to both get some exercise and to receive comfort in the inconsolable desert from the su supply of the garden vegetables. After toiling and sweating for many days digging that rocky spot, he hit a flat stone. He lifted it with great effort, and there he saw a tomb with a body in it, dressed in the holy robes of a priest as if it had been buried yesterday. This body was emitting a wonderful fragrance. Father Panaratos had been an ascetic there for over 50 years, but he had never heard about the life or death of any famous solitary like the one in the tomb. After his first shock, he began to cry, praying, Saint of God, reveal to me who you are and how many years you have lived in this desolate place. I thank you for revealing your sainthood to me, the unworthy. Father Panaratos, devout elder that he was, remained awake all night long, praying and contemplating, because he planned to report his finding to the holy monastery of Great Lavra. Early in the morning, though, after he fell asleep, he dreamed of the unknown saint who spoke to him sternly. What are you contemplating doing, Abba? Saint of God, I thought to notify the monastery of Lavra to come and take you, for you are forgotten and neglected here, he replied, stricken with terror. We did not do our ascetic labors together, so why are you transferring my body? I strived here for more than fifty years. Put me back, please. Place the tombstone on the grave, and you will not reveal anything to anyone during your lifetime. Elder Panaratos woke up, covered the tomb, and felt better. He always prayed to this unknown saint. After he became quite old and came to live in Kafso Kalivia, just before his passing, he told the fathers what had happened without revealing the location or other details. In sublimity of life and poverty lived seven monks, or twelve according to some hermits. Among the forests of the holy mountain, we do not know whether or not they are still alive, completely unclothed and fed like the fowl of the air on wild greens, roots, chestnuts, and pine nuts. It has been said that they received Holy Communion in the cave of St. Peter from Father Daniel, the famous Hezekist. The most learned monk, Spiridon Cambanos the physician, a Lavratan, wrote about these earthly angels and heavenly men. And what can we say of those who live in the area of Chironera, where only the overseeing eyes of God, who knows all things, can know their way of life? The famous hermit Damaskinos of St. Anne's, while digging in his barren hut above the hermitage of the Holy Trinity, discovered three holy corpses intact, giving off an ineffable fragrance. Around the first hour he was contemplating, notifying the skeet of the holy monastery of Lavra to tell of his marvelous find. While he was praying about it, three heavenly men appeared in front of him with stern looks on their faces, and said, If we had wished, Elder Damaskinos, to be glorified by men, we would not have come to live on these cliffs, where we were deprived even of water for the love of Christ and the heavenly kingdom. So for this reason, place these relics in a hidden place until the time of common resurrection of the dead. With reverence and joy, the pious hermit did exactly as they said. He placed them in a spot known to him alone and not to the fathers of the skeet. Chapter 4 On Vigils when the righteous Akakios, who did his ascasis in a desolate skeet of Kafso Kalivia, was asked to speak on sleep and vigil, he replied, Half an hour of sleep is enough for a true monk. He himself either stood up all night long or knelt, praying and chanting with great courage in spite of the fact that he suffered from a hernia and was very old. He would sleep very little in the mornings, sometimes leaning on his arm or on anything else, long enough not to lose clarity of mind from extreme sleeplessness. He viewed sleep as a treacherous and undermining enemy of the soul. 
he said that nothing increases sinful desires more than excessive sleep, and nothing subdues them as much as sleeplessness. He made a bed with thick, knotted tree branches nailed sparsely together without a mattress so that he could not rest his body as well as it would have liked, and so that he could be awakened easily. According to his biographer, he slept no more than four hours a day. Even the blessed St. Gregory Palamas had an ongoing battle against the flesh and sleep. For three whole months in his hermitage above the holy monastery of Lavra, he remained sleepless and in prayer. He did, however, then interrupt this ascetic labor so that his mind might not be harmed by too extended a vigil. The Athenite Russian, St. Siloanos the New, who was canonized in 1987, was born in 1866 and died in 1938. He was a monk of St. Pantolemon's monastery. He lived a righteous and pure life of universal love, unceasing prayer, and humility. His life came to a peaceful end in peace, and he left behind the memory of a holy man. His biography was written by Archimandrite Sophronios, the egumen of the Holy Patriarchal and Stravropedic Monastery of the Honored Forerunner in England. St. Siloanos, among his many virtues, labored especially for sleeplessness, as he knew from experience how much it contributes to attaining cleansing of mind, uplifting in prayer, and cultivation of joyful mourning. He would not lie on a bed to sleep. Instead, he would spend the entire night praying, either standing up or sitting on a stool. He would sleep for only 15 to 20 minutes and then rise again to pray. He would rest again later, intermittently. His entire sleep in 24 hours would total only two hours. We asked the blind elder, Simeon, the Kafso Kalivitin, how can the soul be cleansed from impure thoughts, desires, and other passions? And he replied, by not knowing what it is like to get any sleep. In an Iverton skeet, there lived a most pious hero monk, Eurasimus, the hymnographer. When he was to celebrate the Divine Liturgy the next day, he would stay awake all night long in reading and in prayer. God took him away at a young age. His brief life had been very full, for he had pleased the Lord. A struggling hermit said, By sleeping a lot, our mind becomes opaque. Haji Georges rested standing up at his bench in the church all night long. He hardly knew his cell. He devoted his entire days to his suffering brothers and his nights to prayer. One day a young monk asked Father N., who was 86 years old, Elder, how many hours should a monk sleep? Listen, my brother. St. Theodore the Studite and St. Simeon the New Theologian say that about four to five hours a day should be enough sleep. But Abba Arsenios in the Yerundicon declares that for a laboring monk, one hour of sleep should be sufficient. St. Akakios the Kafsa Kalivitan used to say that I find half an hour of sleep not enough, but if the saint says so, we should try it. And you? How long do you rest? My brother, what is the need for such a question? For my benefit and for the love of Christ, tell me. I'll tell you. One hour and twenty-four is enough. Do you sleep one hour through or with interruptions? With interruptions, of course. A quarter of an hour here or there. And how is your time spent? Unfortunately, now that I have a double hernia, I do not stand to read the Psalter or the Gospels and to say the Jesus Prayer. The entire Psalter and New Testament? Naturally, the entire ones. Every day? Every day. Every day. The only thing is, I cannot read standing up anymore. That is what happens with old age. Father Joseph the Cave Dweller, at the beginning of his stay on Athos, did not have a spiritual father. Yet he lived for a short time near the cave of St. Athanasios the Athenite, not far from the great Lavra. He spent a strict life there, and thus succeeded in standing up for eight days without food and sleep. He said, No ascesis brings forth more blessings than the deprivation of sleep. Indeed, sleeplessness dissolves the body. And he also said, 
The worst phase of the passion of sleep is when grace leaves us and we are filled with boredom and darkness without any consolation to be found. Once I was greatly tested in this respect. I was struggling to continue, but my strength was almost gone. I interrupted my struggle to pray to the Lord with tears. Lord, they come to weaken my good intentions. Immediately I heard a sweet voice within me. Don't you suffer all these for the sake of my love? My fatigue, like a cloud which had been covered the sun, vanished right away, and with tears in my eyes I jumped for joy like a child. Yes, Lord, for your sake, help me in my weakness. An elder said, Sleep should become a servant, not a master. A Hagurite in conclusion, It is not possible for a spiritual life to exist without vigil. According to his contemporaries, Elder Artemios from Grigoriu never sat down on his chair during any service, including the all-night vigils. Until his death, he remained an upstanding, steadfast pillar of the church and of prayer. Chapter 5 On Heresies and Other Religions Representatives of the Papist Byzantine Emperor Michael Palaiologos and the patriarch John Vecos came to Manathos to impose by force a union of the Orthodox Church with Rome. The Athenite monks, frontier guardians and soldiers of Orthodoxy, reacted peacefully and with courage to all their efforts, which were marked by savagery, violence, and criminality, the stigmas of papal history. In the Protaton, Vecos's men hanged the overseer of the Holy Community, on a piece of marble which is preserved to this day, beheaded the neo-martyrs and confessors of the faith remaining there, thirteen of them altogether, who were occupying various cells in Kyries. They were slain for steadfastly defending the Orthodox faith and because they would not accept union with the unrepentant Pope. Such were our holy forefathers. Beautiful branches, mystical grapes, tireless defenders and trustees of Orthodoxy, and its holy tradition. The holy martyrs of Vatopedi were as many as the twelve apostles. Their abbot Euthymios also suffered martyrdom for the sake of our holy faith during the savage invasion by the troops of Emperor Michael Palaiologos and the patriarch Vecos. The twelve were hanged and Euthymios was drowned after he was tied with heavy chains and submerged in the sea of Kalamahaji. In addition to them, worth mentioning also are the holy martyrs of Ivaron, who were drowned in the sea by the soldiers of the emperor and his patriarch. All 26 holy martyrs of Zografu complete the sanctified course of martyrs of our orthodoxy. They were burned as a pure offering by papists, within the monastery's towers. Our Holy Father, Nikiforos, who had been a papist, when he joined the Eastern Orthodox Church, became a hesychist in the desert of the Holy Mountain. There he wrote the method of noetic prayer, which is included in the Philokalia. St. Gregory Palamas, champion of theologians, took part in three major synods at which he struggled against the Latin-minded heresies of Barlam Akindidos and Gregoros, who denied the divine and uncreated energies of God. Monks are soldiers of Christ, commandos of the church, always defending truth and the faith, and fighting until death against all deceitful heresy and error. The monks of the holy mountain, following centuries of tradition, are able to present us with a calendar list of Athenite martyrs and defenders of orthodoxy. January 4th, 12 Holy Martyrs of Vatopedi. February 14th, Holy Martyr Dominos. March 22nd, Holy Martyr Euthymios of Ivaron Skeet. March 22nd, Righteous Lucas of Strabno Nikita. April 10th, Holy Martyr Chrysanthos of Xenophantos. April 16th, Holy Martyr Christophoros of Dionysiu. April 19th, Holy Martyr Agathangelos of Esphigimenu, May 1st, Holy Martyrs Euthymios and Ignatius of Iveron, May 7th, 
Holy Martyr Pacomius of St. Paul's, May 22nd, Holy Martyr Pavlos of St. Anne's, June 26th, Holy Martyr David of St. Anne's, July 3rd, Holy Martyr Eurasimus of Kutlumusiu, July 6th, Holy Martyr Kyrlos of Hilandari, July 10th, Holy Martyr Nicodemus of St. Anne's, July 11th, Holy Martyrs Nicodemus of Vatopedi and Nectarios of St. Anne's, August 21st, 4th, Holy Martyrs Hero Martyr Cosmas at the Los, equal to the Apostles, Philotheu. September 14th, Holy Martyr Macarius of Dionysiu. September 20th, Holy Martyr Hilarion of St. Anne's. September 22nd, Holy Martyr Cosmas, one of the 26 Blessed Martyrs of Zografu. October 6th, Holy Martyr Macarius of St. Anne's. October 8th, Holy Martyr Ignatius of Iveron Skeet. October 29th, Holy Martyr Tim Timothy of Esfigimenu. November 2nd, Holy Martyr Dionysius of Iveron Skeet. November 13th, Holy Martyr Damascinos of Lavra. December 3rd, Holy Martyr Cosmas of St. Anne's. December 5th, Holy Martyrs Nectarios of Philotheu and Cosmas, the first monk of Vatopedi along with the Holy Martyrs of Keries, December 26th, Holy Martyr Constantine the Russian of Lavra, December 30th, Holy Martyr Gideon of Karakalu. The most ascetic and holy Herotheus the teacher was always fasting. A philosopher according to Christian understanding, as well as knowledgeable of the world's philosophy, he was born in 1686, Originally from Kalamata, he fought vehemently to protect our holy faith against the heretic Molinumos. He was also a hesychist, as he did spend his spiritual labors on the deserted island of Giura, across from Manathos. He died in 1745, and his sanctified relics continue to work various miracles. At one time, Father B went to a village on business for his monastery. The villagers came to him as soon as he arrived, asking him persistently to help them defend the truth before an evangelical preacher who, using quotations from the Bible, was bothering them greatly with slanders regarding the veneration of saints and the Theotokos. The monk was simple and almost illiterate, and he felt awkward, but after he had thought for a while, recalling all he had pre frequently read about the saints and their lives, he invited the Protestant preacher to meet with him and proposed this. Let us light a fire, he said, in the middle of the village square. Each one of us will go through it and let God prove this way which from the two of us has the truth. Very early the next morning the villagers gathered wood and piled it up in a great heap in the middle of the square. Father B arrived, but the preacher did not come. He had fled, taking the first boat out at daylight. The whole village raised cries of joy for the glorious victory over the teachings of human deceit. When Father B returned to the monastery, the other monks asked him, Were you prepared to go through the fire? I was anxious, but I did not doubt our faith, and I thought, On this earth you deserve nothing but to be in hell. It would be better if you were burned here on earth than to be burning through eternity. Let us then enter into the fire. Thus did this deeply humble, simple monk defend our faith, just as, he, just as he had the first martyrs and the spiritual fathers before him. Frequently, the fathers of Manathos say, If we were to remain silent when our faith needs defending against heresies, what then would be the point of our staying on these cliffs all these many years? Dogmas cannot enter the common market as material goods can. When questioned as to whether or not miracles occur in other religions, an elder replied, There is a difference. Even Hoja is a miracle worker. He uses, by using magic, he tries to make light appear. In contrast, we ignore any light coming from the devil. Some hold their noses, pull their ears, rub their eyes, and cause illusions. 
We ask God for a miracle, not the devil. We fight evil day and night. A pious, charismatic Hagiarite who lived in North America for many years said, The Orthodox Church imitates the humility of the Lord Jesus. Many seeing the exactness of our faith marvel and change from heretics to Orthodox. They have overlooked the head to revere the cap. The wise, vigilant Father Kalinikos said when he was asked to give his opinion of the Russian heresy of the name worshippers. An elder spoke this way about love for the pure faith. Anger is needed only when we defend our faith. It is not needed for the defense of ourselves. If someone speaks ill against us, we ought to accept it. We should be angry, however, when our faith is attacked. Anger used to defend orthodoxy is appropriate. Very often our youthful heart was refreshed by the cool fountain of teaching which flowed from the venerable Hieromonk Athanasios the Ivaratan. He would so often say, quote, The Protestant North, through the professors of our two Greek universities, cooled our warm affectations towards our sweetest mother Panagia. Thus for a time she was distanced from our prayers as direct intercessor and mediator for us to her son, even some clergy, when discussing prayer, ignore the Theotokos and repeatedly refer to her as the first after the one, meaning that she is the intercessor closest to God, whereas the hymnography of the church through and through calls her by blessed name. It is unacceptable that our Greek Orthodox Church should be influenced by such a rationalistic, Germanic, Protestant spirit. I was asked, which is the right way to say, O Holy Theotokos, save us, or to say, Most Holy Theotokos, intercede for us. This question was influenced by some modernized, Protestant-minded Orthodox people whom I have considered most disrespectful enemies of Panagia. I replied to them, The accepted way, always, is to say, Save us. A Lutheran minister from Oslo came to me once. He was a friend and student of Orthodoxy. We talked about many things. He asked me about the Theotokos. My reply to him was, We worship God, we honor the saints, and we venerate the only mother of God with pure filial emotions, for she is our sweetest mother by grace. Oh, how you are deprived. I told him, Because you do not venerate her, who is the second after God to administer his gifts to all mankind. According to Augustine, Three things could not have been more perfectly created by our omnipotent God than these. The Incarnation, the Virgin, and the blessed life of the just in the life to come. Chapter 6 On Having No Possessions and Voluntary Poverty Beneath the tattered clothing and destitute appearance of the ascetics, lie a wealth of hidden virtues, as well as a spirit which is contemptuous against and victorious over the materialistic world. Within their forced deprivation and hardship is the treasure of humility and the visible philosophy of life according to Christ. True ascetics pursue this appearance. They do not wear new clothes, receive no money, and deny themselves the pleasures of life. Their self-denial follows the teachings of the Eternal One, Quote, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Luke 9.23 They do not pay attention to appearances, particularly to the outer shell, to beautiful clothes, shoes, face, hair, and body. Attention is focused on substance and the depth of the inner man, the adornment of mind and heart with uncreated loveliness, heavenly brightness, and divine beauty. The hermit Peter, the Hospitalian, had such a spiritual beauty, not only meek in spirit, but poor in body as well. This we were told by the Reverend Elder Eurasimos the Hymnographer, by the Danilites, by the Thompsonites, by our Reverend Elder Paisios, and by Elder Joachim, and others. Peter was a simple and primitive soul, tall in spirit and short in stature, for which reason he was called Petrakis, or little Peter. He would climb Athos to collect mountain tea, 
to sell along with Komboskinis he made to earn a living. At one time he was offering extra money, but he refused to have any of it. He had such gentleness and spiritual nobility, such love and simple manner, that he once walked for many hours to the hut of a monk who requested to be under his obedience to inform him, I came to tell you not to trouble yourself by coming to St. Peter's cave where I live because I am going to die. When the other monk inquired about what he could offer him, Peter asked only for some boiled water in which he placed some of his mountain tea, added a bit of sugar, which he kept in another pouch, and drank. For him, one kilogram of sugar was enough for the entire year, and there was always some left over for the following year. At one time when he paid a visit to Elder Joachim and Karias when it was getting dark, the elder asked him to spend the night. I am going to the monastery of Zeroputamu, he replied. I will walk until dark then rest under a chestnut tree until dawn. That is what he did. That night, though, it poured torrential rain. He was soaked through his clothes and caught a bad cold. He returned to his hut to say goodbye to all his neighbors. Shortly afterwards, he fell asleep in the Lord. There used to be a father confessor in Kyrias, Father Euramos, Euramenos, who lived this in a Kavian, a room with a kitchen where the layman stayed. There the monks who wanted to fight sleep and sleepiness while praying would suspend themselves by ropes, the kavia. For this reason they were called kaviotis. In this place Father Euramos received guests and workmen from around the world for counseling and confessions. He offered his hospitality to all, fed them, and strengthened their life in Christ. He possessed nothing to such an extent that by sunset he did not even want a paras, the Turkish monetary unit that was during the Ottoman Empire, to continue. An elder named Makarios had absolutely no possessions. He used a tool called a kosa to harvest greens and sell them to feed animals. He would not accept any gifts. He liked to be self-sufficient. His little dwelling sparkled with cleanliness and good order. He said, Here, on Manathos, we need two eyes to see with, but in the outside world, you need four. Elder Nifon, who lived in Katanakia, loved festivities and had a delightful habit during the celebration of any feast. He would pay his respects to someone's house by always extending his blessings and good wishes. Two hermits who were brothers, Oristus and Constantine, lived in an almost empty hut. Constantine, who reposed in the Lord at Kiranera, was the embodiment of poverty. He never wore shoes in either summer or winter. Two famous hermits, Sophronios and Gabriel, lived in the hesychistic cell of Gionacopulo. Also, a Romanian ascetic lived in the nativity cave where he led an angelic life. He did no craft, but spent his entire life in prayer with a prayer rope. He lived entirely on the Father's charity. In the cave of St. Peter the Athenite, where even the mere presence of a person would interrupt the solitude, there once lived a totally impoverished hermit. He went about wearing no shoes throughout the entire year. He led a carefree life not having even an axe or a pair of pruning shears. He did his obedience under Father Daniel, a visionary hesychist. If someone brought them some chickpeas or dry bread, a few fava beans or a bit of fish, only then did he have something to eat. There were several pious fathers who lived in Kerasia over time. Among them was Elder Cosmas, who was nicknamed the Garlic Man, and who had a hesychistic cell in the forest. Father Neophytos, Elder Daniel the Romanian, and Father John, who was the elder of Father Daniel. They devoted their whole life to ceaseless prayer and other spiritual endeavors. When their relics were translated, they had a yellow, waxy appearance, a sign of sanctification. They ran the race with force and with constant prayer to Jesus. Holy Dionysios of Olympus was born at the end of the 15th century at Platina of Tricala, 
Prior to the construction of the Monastery of the Holy Trinity, he lived on Manathos, where he loved and practiced the hesychistic life. In a small hut belonging to Karakalu, he lived a life of angelic fasting, all-night vigils, and prayer. He fed only on a few chestnuts each day, and those only after the ninth hour. He was so poor, this blessed one, that he never locked his door. He owned nothing but a worthless, tattered rasso. He stayed there only three years praying to God. He never acquired any material possessions even to the time he came to be called by God to depart for heaven. The spiritual father, Yakovos from Vigla, used to say, Look upon my humility and struggle and forgive all my sins. He devoted himself entirely to hardship and ascetic labors. He used to carry sand on foot for five hours at a time from the shoreline to where he built his chapel. Only God knows how Hermit Dionysios, a fool for Christ's sake, maintained himself and where he found oil to burn in the lamps in his hut. The main reason for this was that he had never asked for charity. Only near the end of his life did he accept any. He arrived on Athos in 1842 and reposed in 1880. So much did he desire to be a non-possessor, to have a carefree life and poverty, that he was almost kicked out of the lava for not taking care of his holy apostle cell in Caracia. His vineyard and orchard were full of weeds. All this man's efforts were directed toward the tending of another kind of field, the one where spiritual vigilance is cultivated and maintained. His name was Yakovos. He came from Chimara of northern Hipporos, and he served the country during the War of 1912. With immense effort and sacrifice, he had built and dedicated a church in honor of the three hierarchs. He was destitute, and his hut consisted of one room only. For a mattress, he used a bale of hay. He also kept another one in the event of the rare visitors staying overnight. A cape was his blanket, and in the morning he would stow his straw bed in the corner. Usually he ate only greens and dry bread. Elder Chrysostomos was an innocent and possessionless hermit. Wearing no shoes, he struggled ascetically in the cave of Holy Peter, the Athenite. His food was chestnuts, greens, and dry bread. I met also another one who was indeed a Chrysostomos because of his sweet utterances and Christ-like meekness. He lived in a barren hut in Kafsokalivza's skeet. I met him one time while I was with my elder, who was his contemporary and had learned the craft of wood carving in that barren hut. This is mentioned in his book, Memories from Panagia's Garden. What can one say about the ascetic elder, George, who resided in the tiny Lavrotin Cathisma of St. Constantine? He dressed in a tattered robe, went barefoot, and always prayed in a standing position, like a continually burning oil lamp. He had only a wooden stool for sitting or sleeping. Such was Elder George. Like two lonely birds, peaceful together, were the hermits Antonios and Simeon. They had come originally from Athens. One took care of the household and the other of the garden, for which he had to bring water from far away. They lived on very little. They never spoke evil of anyone. Their hut was a small, simple one near the monastery of Pantocrator, and it resembled a bird's nest. Simeon died first. A few la years later, Antonius followed, approximately 100 years old. After Simeon died, Antonius had struggled to endure loneliness. So they took him to live in the monastery of Kutlumisiu to be looked after, but only for a short time, for soon he returned to his beloved hut, dragging his feet and bent over almost to the ground, but nevertheless happy and rejoicing. Finally he was delivered from his ascetic labors and voluntary deprivation. Because he had no one to dig up his relics after the customary three years in the ground, he appeared to many, pleading with them and persuading them to do so. One monk in a Sinobitic monastery lived for sixty years in the same rasso that he had worn on the day of his tonsure. A proven athlete of poverty, simplicity, and deprivation was Elder Kalinikos, a Cypriot, who did his ascetic labors with his brother George Gregory, 
excuse me, in St. Anne's Skeet. He continued his ascetic endeavors in Stavrununia on Cyprus. At his repose, he left behind only a rotten mattress infested with bed bugs, a wooden box full of mites and stuffed with rags suitable only for firewood, a pair of shoes mended a thousand times, and two or three forgotten paras in a wooden box. To those gathered around the elder's natural brother, Higuman Barnabas said with tears in his eyes, Look, fathers, at Kalinikos's wealth, which he acquired during his life as a monk. Truly, a monk is the one who possesses nothing during his present life on earth except Christ himself. Bishop Herothius of Miletopoulos, who stayed in the hut of St. Eleftherios of St. Anski, owed absolutely nothing. In addition to all the other virtues he had of self-control, patience, and meekness, he was also particularly known for his love toward destitute monks, to whom he distributed every bit of his monthly income. He fell asleep in the Lord at the age of 88. In the hermitage of Elder Neophytos, nothing else could be found but a bag full of dried bread. Only on weekends would he visit the Danalites, who were and still are a comfort in the desert, to eat with them at the trapeza. Then he would vanish for the whole week. It was rumored that when he fell asleep in the Lord at the monastery of Lavra, his countenance shone. Elder A. of the holy cell of St. Harlambos and Keries was so poor that he wore no other raso but the one which belonged to his elder. Elder Nectarios, from Romania, lived above the skeet of St. Anne, near the hut named St. Artemtimios, which belonged to the monastery of St. Pantolemon. He never left Manathos from the time he was tonsured. He was poor, having absolutely no possessions. He sold to the other fathers sticks which he had cut for use with climbing bean plants. Near the end of his life, he spent his entire days in total solitude and prayer. Elder Chrysanthos of St. Anne's recounted that after the repose of the pious elder Charitan of St. Anne's, the only thing found in his hut was a clay urn for water. Father Avacum, from the day of his tonsure to the day of his death, went barefoot, with only one exception. On the feast day of St. Athanasios of Athos, he would put shoes on. The ever-memorable Father Axentios the Gregoriatin was never seen wearing new clothes. He wore mended undershirts, and he owned one pair of shoes which he put on while he was within the monastery. At other times he went barefoot everywhere, along all the roads and paths and rocks of Manathos. His bed was a wooden bench. He had a small table and some simple icons above his bed, and there were only a few utensils on his shelf, the only interior decorations of his cell. Crippled Michael, the Lavratan, had nothing in his cell, absolutely no possessions. The day he reposed, he received the same honors as a bishop. His face shone and had a yellow, waxy appearance. An elder with no possessions said, There was a little aged monk who led a simple life. He owned nothing. This is the way a person can be free. All the things that we today call conveniences, even a tiny sponge, can be a hindrance. The only convenience for anyone is to simplify his life, to limit himself to what is absolutely necessary. Only then can he be free. The hut of the ever-memorable Methodius, a hero monk and hesychist in Caracia, was poor and humble like a bird's nest, either having neither well for water nor a chapel nearby, unlike most other huts. The elder led a completely carefree life with his young subordinate, with no stress nor anticipation for anything, nor care for worldly possessions or conveniences. Blessed were both of these monks, runners of the race to heaven, poor beggars for the love of Christ. The elder would send his obedient servant to Lavra to ask for some charity. They were pleased with whatever was given them. Father Methodius was a graduate in theology from the University of Athens, and he had abandoned all glory of the world for his salvation. The food usually served in their sanctified hut was boiled water with some flour made into a gravy, 
When they had a few grapes, they would place them in a container and add water. Once another monk visited them, and they offered him some of this ascetic drink. What kind of juice is this, brother? he asked with curiosity. The fifth, Father Methodius replied, which meant that it was their drink watered down for the fifth time. Toward the end of his life, Father Methodius moved to the cave of St. Athanasius the Athenite. He also wrote hymns and composed excellent musical settings. Eurasimus Skimnakis, in his book about Father Methodius, writes, quote, He leads a regimented life and studies constantly. In 1903, Father Methodius served as the Secretary of the Holy Community. He died in 1920. Poor hermit Anatolios, who died in 1938, earned his living by gathering mountain tea and wild flowers at Athos's mountaintop. They would ask him, Don't you endanger yourself climbing on the ravines and cliffs? He would reply, Not at all, blessed ones. I fasten myself with ropes. I am used to it because before I became a monk, I used to be a sailor. He lived near the Kiriakon of Holy Cross in Kafsokalivyaski. He was one of the most destitute and the most pious of monks. He used to ask the Skeet's miller for the milled flour which was unsuitable for use, containing as it did sand from the millstones. On days of the week when oil was allowed, he would eat food mixed with oil, which he measured with a small saucer. Into this oil he dipped an onion or a piece of bread. What an ascetic race he ran with dignity and perseverance. He ate cooked food only when he was invited as a guest. He loved the icon of the crucifixion, before which he offered his tearful and ceaseless prayers, and frequently from the icon itself would flow tears. He also revered Panagia greatly. At night, when lying on his bed, turned on one side, and until he fell asleep, he would chant with all his might, It is truly me to bless thee, the Theotokos. He knew very little music, but with a deep, loud voice would chant this hymn in the second tone, the one in which the archangel had originally sung it to the mother of God. Often he would, he could sing it up to the ten times a night. His obedient subordinate at first was bothered by it, but later got used to it. Any time he went to Kyrgyz to sell his tea, he would go to the cell called Axion Asti, which is named for the magnification of the Theotokos and in honor of the appearance of the archangel to her when the hymn was first sung. After he venerated the icon, he chanted the hymn to the Theotokos with great piety. While he was chanting, the oil lamp would sway. The fathers thought that this occurred because of his thunderous voice. He then went to the narthex to sing, and again the lamp would sway. When the other fathers sang, the lamp remained motionless. These are wonders worth mentioning, worked by such a simple and childlike soul, in which dwelt the grace of the Lord, who is great in his will and marvelous in his works. Elder Theophylactos, also worth mentioning, lived in the skeet of Xenophantos as an obedient monk. He kept God in his heart, and God looked after him. He came from a wealthy family, but he left behind the vain and pleasurable things of this world and placed himself under obedience to the simple elder Cosmas. His mother wanted to send him a hundred lira at that time, but he refused it. While praying, he always stood up throughout the night. His countenance was like that of an angel. Elder Euthemios lived in the same skeet in a small goat pen hut named for the holy archangels. In the center of his hut, he used to hang a big sack filled with dry bread, the food he ate all through his life. A hermit said, Fast, vigilance, and prayer. Anyone who practices these virtues can succeed in anything. One should lead a simple life. You see, my hut is empty. In any household, only the necessary things should be there. Too many things are a hindrance to the spiritual life. Nuskeet's ever-memorable elder, Theophylactos, reposed in the Lord peacefully in the year 1986. He was a simple, humble, guileless monk, enduring all trials and tribulations, coming from either men or Satan. Near the end of his life, he lost his sight, but he never complained about his blindness. 
He was particularly known for his apostolic lack of possessions and his carefree attitude in relation to the material things which are needed for sustenance. He cared neither for any occupation nor for money. He unceasingly prayed and thanked God for everything. He did his obedience under blessed Joachim Spetseris, of whom he f spoke frequently to me, the least of all. Later on, he became a student of Elder Joseph the Cave Dweller. Before the loss of his sight, his obedient tasks were to distribute all mail for the skeet and to light the oil lamps for all the prayer stands, which he visited twice a day, no matter what the weather conditions were. Chapter 7 On Raising Children An elder said, Prayer is trusting God. When you trust is completely in God, it is not even necessary to pray for something, for God takes over. It's just that one ought to wait with patience for the fruit to ripen and fall off the tree. Therefore, parents, trust your children in God, for you have given them only your flesh, but God has created their souls so he is obliged to take care of them. Another elder offered the following thoughts. A child needs a lot of guidance and love. Watching television is destructive. A man gives his flesh to his child. God creates a child's soul. When a child grows up, the parents are not responsible for him any longer. God assigns a guardian angel to every person born to help him throughout his entire life. Therefore, should we not trust in God ourselves? You ought to help your children to a point. Beyond that, leave them under God's care. Their guardian angel is always by them. One might say, if a person yields to temptation, his guardian angel strays away. But the angel does not despair. He stands nearby. Even when one goes astray, still God, through the guardian angel, sends good thoughts to that person. We should not distance ourselves from God, for that is so painful. The guardian angel tries throughout one's life to introduce good thoughts, waits and suffers, is saddened when a man commits a sin, and stands before God empty-handed. Let us think about that. That alone creates such pain. If for only this reason, one should not distance himself from God's presence by refusing to do his will. Some angels, with some effort, and some with none at all present a man's soul to God. But other angels, with great effort, torment, and suffering come before God empty-handed. It is so painful. Imagine. It is worthwhile for one to strive with dignity so that his guardian angel might not be hurt. There are many people who have seen their guardian angel. If only one can see his angel, he will not ask for anything else. When we see little infants smile when sleeping, it is because they see their angel. You ought to teach small children how to pray, for God answers their prayers. The children's prayer ought to enter their hearts. There is no benefit from a prayer unless it is from the depths of one heart. Try to help children when they are small with kindness so that they experience a deeper meaning in life. Always treat them with kindness. To his visitors, an experienced ascetic gave good advice on raising children. I am still sad because I did not go to confession until I was 18 years old. I am still sad about it. When a child is about six to seven, it is time to see a spiritual father. Let it be so. So, as soon as you return to your homes from the holy mountain, pay attention to your children, catechize them, and guard them, especially with your prayers. Pray as the patriarch Jacob prayed for his children. Pray like this, Holy Theotokos, protect, help, and oversee my children. Also cross yourselves while praying and chant a hymn to the Panagia. Watch over them. Make sure you know where they go at night and with whom they keep company. For bad company destroys good morals. Your child might be good, but someone else's might be a bad influence on him. This is my advice to all lay people. Chapter 8 On Despair A nun possessed by a spirit of despair would say over and over again, 
I am afraid that I will not be saved. And a wise elder replied to her, Who could then be saved if monastics cannot? For whom has God created paradise? We will be saved. We ought to be joyful. We should admit that we are sinners, but also glorify God. To trust in God is like a continuous prayer. Think no evil. Blasphemous thoughts are like airplanes. They fly by, they disturb our tranquility, and then they are gone. It is up to me to say when I am a sinner, not when the devil wants me to. The elder also said, Various people can be comforted near a person who is free from stress. A hermit said, What guarantees a safe journey to eternity is effort, dignity, the sense of being unworthy before God, hope, the spiritual oxygen, consolation, and certainty, not misery and compelled obedience and forced prayer, not tears and sadness. These all come from Satan. Yes, I ought to weep for my sins, but all the while hoping in God's love. But I cannot stand it if I cry out because the devil wants me to, to despair. Many times Satan crushes a person with despair, and the devil becomes the victor. But this does not happen when one is like a child on his father's arm, trusting. Our trust in God is a ceaseless prayer that brings positive results. Despair comes from the devil. Don't say, oh, what has happened to me? But give yourself to God totally and hope in Him. Our obedience should not be done with misery or because we happen to be monastics. The elder or the eldress is not like the emperor Diocletian who gives us orders. Rather, we should be grateful to our Yerondas and Yerondises because our obedience to them protects us. We thus must not react to their directions negatively nor disobey them. An elder said, I have not dealt with many things. I am familiar with some patristic teachings, and I, I keep trying nonetheless. One thing has become clear to me. There is no bitterness for man. When you face bitter situations spiritually, eventually they become sweet. We come across a person who has sinned, has regretted it, and repented sincerely. He is sad and confesses and receives divine consolation. If one does not feel this way, it means that he should understand that something is not quite right with his conscience. He should go to confession again, then consolation will follow. This is the way we should go. A person shares in his fellow man's sorrow, prays for him, and asks God to help him. Chapter 9 On Simplicity there was an ascetic in Kurulia, the holy mountain's most austere desert, who had a little kitten to comfort him and to protect him from snakes and mice. One day a vulture was flying over, and from the solitary sky spotted its prey, dived down, and snatched the kitten up in its claws. The ascetic was upset, and, not knowing what to do, immediately entered his chapel to lodge a complaint to the hermitage's saintly protector. He went up to the oil lamp, hanging before the protector's icon, and blew out the flame to emphasize the point he was going to make. He had always considered this saint his friend, so he told him about the sad incident and demanded his help. Why, my saint, did you not protect the kitten? He complained. At that very moment he heard the kitten crying outside the door. It had been freed from the attacker's talons. An elder once told me a similar story about a monk who had gone to Kerias for some errand and had left the door of his cell open, trusting in the protection of St. Nicholas, its patron. When he returned, he found that thieves had stripped the cell of everything. He then went to the church and with courage and in a friendly tone of voice said to St. Nicholas, Why did you not protect the cell from robbers, my saint? Starting today, unless you reveal the robbers, I will not light your lampada. And he did just as he had threatened. A few days later, the thieves were caught, an evidence of the elders' faith, confidence, and simplicity, as well as of St. Nicholas's real presence there. In fact, the robbers humbled themselves and repented 
and returned everything they had taken to the elder. A very simple monk named Ormaelos lived in Great Lavra, where his obedience was to herd the monastery's rams. He wore tattered clothes and carried his prayer rope in his hand always. He was completely guileless, with a primitive, innocent soul which was filled with divine grace. It is said that once he saw Panagia in Lavra walking around. He did not realize who she was and said, What is a woman doing in the Lavra? One of the workmen was abusive to him. He would swear at him and put him out in the snow, but the simple one endured all of it calmly and with kindness. It was the hermit Damaskinos from St. Basil's Desert who told us many things about this Ormaleos. A simple, childlike elder told me, Monks in the past were simple men, guileless and with no evil. They were God's little lambs. Although he is now bedridden, the simple elder Methodius still lives in St. Nilos's cell. This is his prayer. Lord, on the day you take this poor one, place him among your servants. I do not expect to be among either bishops or priests, but just to get a spot in a corner. An elder said, Prayer does not tire, but gives rest, the way a child feels in his mother's arms. If one were to observe some monks praying, he might think that they are like children. Indeed, seeing them making all kinds of motions, he might even think they'd gone crazy. Some of them are like the little child who runs to his father, pulling his coat and saying, I don't know how, but you must do this for me. From a certain perspective, such people as I am talking about could be seen as useless. Why? Because they cannot work. Their bodies become as if paralyzed, and their bones are stiffened like candles. They are unable to move. When God's love falls upon a person in abundance, it dissolves him. An elder said, A natural simplicity come becomes sanctification in a natural way. A simple but holy man, when he once had to take care of a poor sick person, went down to the seashore to the church of the Ascension, lifted up his arms and prayed, my holy ascension, give me a little fish for my sick charge. And what a miracle, a fish came into his hands. He cooked it and thanked God and the holy ascension. A simple holy man, lacking a certain sharpness of mind, might see a misled person as holy. A clever holy man, however, uses discernment to know if someone is misled. Having intelligence is a gift from God like bodily strength. We must use whatever gifts God gives us for sanctification and salvation. Those whom we see as being deprived, orphans, the crippled, the dull-witted, and so forth, God helps them and graces them with gifts. God is just. In Kyrgyz, Father Kilo had a monk in obedience, here a monk Pavlos, who celebrated the liturgy with great reverence. In particular, he would not reprimand anyone for his mistakes during the services. If he had to correct someone, he would do it by motioning to him very discreetly. The hermit, Father Philarotos, from Karulia, was taken to Thessaloniki to appear in court, where he was unjustly accused of taking an ancient book which had been stolen by a tourist. He had no money to pay the fine. Either you pay, Father, or you go to jail the judge said to him, I prefer to go to prison. I have no money. Besides this way, I will remember the eternal prison, he replied. When finally some of the faithful paid the fine, he said, I have been freed from the earthly prison. I wonder if I will be set free from the eternal one. Some asked him, How was it in Thessaloniki, Elder Philaratos? How were the people? He had not been there for fifty years, and he replied, What can I say, fathers? They were all rushing about for their salvation. I am the only negligent and lazy one. At one time, Elder Artemios, very simple of soul and manners, was in Piraeus Harbor for some business of the monastery. He was approached and invited by a prostitute to her house, and he, being naive, accepted. Praise be to God, he said, 
that among this multitude of people a person was found to extend me hospitality. The woman showed him to a room, gave him some food, and left. He began to pray using his prayer rope. Shortly after, the woman knocked at the door, but Artemios expected to hear through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, along with the knock, as is done on the Holy Mountain. Since she continued to knock, he cried out, Say, through the prayers, say it, or I'm not going to open. Because she did not say it, he figured it must have been a demonic spirit at the door and kept on praying. I lived for two years in the historical Kelion of St. Nilos the Murgusher. In this hesychistic house, Elder Methodius, a brother of Father Photius from Simonopetra, was also living. Elder Methodius had an outwardly severe appearance, so that as he himself told me, he was nicknamed the Thug. He was not a fool for Christ intentionally, but his entire conduct was like most of the monastics who give signs of being fools for Christ. He was unpretentious, direct, always blaming himself and humble in the extreme. He would say, Since childhood I was a whirlwind. At least I took care of my elderly Yerondas. They called me crazy, but I did not let my monastic family down. I did not take care of my own mother and father, but I took care of my elders, Nilos, Methodius, Charitan, and Antonios. Isn't Panagia going to save me? He who loves Panagia stays here. He had no education at all. Each afternoon during Vespers, when the Theotokion was read, he always wanted to read, O Virgin Theotoko, save us. He said it with a loud voice and compunction that would shake one's whole being. He frequently said, You can easily sin, but you can also easily be saved, as you can be saved with only one paddle movement in a boat. He had been a fisherman in the past. Fishing was his and his elders' handicraft. Elder Methodius was known everywhere on land or sea, all over Athos, because he was also a passionate hunter. He was ferocious in appearance, but humble in intent. He was not a fool, but a monk who resembled the granite rocks hanging over his cell. He was patient and loved solitude, and he had a good, hospitable, childlike heart which would sometimes get stubborn, but at other times he would just smile and his heart would be as soft as cotton. One day he told me, I am going to clear the branches from the path so that people who come through it won't get wet. Perhaps one of them will say, May God forgive him. Even if no one says it, there will still be a blessing for having done it. I was once acquainted with two monks whose faces were a true picture of simplicity and forbearance. They had simple, unaffected souls with no evil or hypocrisy in them. They were lambs of Christ, meek and humble like him. They were Elder A from St. Anne's Skeet and Elder P from New Skeet. They have since departed to the Lord. In the recent past, in the holy mountain's capital of Kyrias, had lived a very simple, non-monastic old man, Giannis. He was called the Ancient because he was always dressed in a very old-fashioned way and held in his right hand a shepherd's staff. One day he went to the Yosephite fathers and said to Father B, I would like you to make me a little icon of Panagia in a cloud and in white. That was the way he had seen her in a vision. We will make you one, old man Giannis, but it will cost you a lot, the monk said. You ask for a lot, but I will give you a little bit, the old man replied. Another time he saw a wolf roaming around near Father Agathangelos' house. Giannis crossed himself and said, My Panagia, save me from the wolf, and I will bring you a container of oil. And indeed, the next morning he brought oil to the icon of Axionesti. In one of Zerputamo's cells lived another simple but meek monk, Elder Antonios T., a brother who was passing by one time, met him and said, What are you doing, old man? What else can I do but wait for Pascha? Pascha, it has passed. We are now in Pentecost. Pentecost? When did it pass? I'm still fasting. I haven't broken my fast yet, the elderly man said, wondering 
and with an unusually simple manner. He was spending most of his time in Dioko Ferfiren. He did not like it when any of the visitors were smoking in the courtyard of the Protaton. He would murmur, anyone who smokes is ungrateful. The church does not need cigarettes. It needs incense, matches, and candles. Chapter 10 On Expatriation and Voluntary Exile Two descendants of royalty were John and his son Euthymios, the builder of the holy monastery of Iveron. They flourished from 960 to 980 A.D. and were students of St. Athanasios the Athenite. Holy Euthymios, while still living in the world, had quarreled with and killed a Jew who had blasphemed the Lord Jesus' name. After that he fell gravely ill, but was cured by the Theotokos, then he went to Mount Athos to be under obedience to the great Cenobitic Athenite Athanasios. The monks of Iveron called Euthymios the New Chrysostom, for he translated the entire Bible and other books from Greek into the Iberian language. St. Savas, the Serbian, was a crown prince. His name before he was professed monk was Rasko, and his father was Stephanos, Nemanja, king of Serbia. His whole family were very pious. Since childhood, this saint loved the angelic monastic life. When some monks from Manathos visited his country, among them was a very pious Russian elder. After he heard from him about the holy monastic life on Manathos, the prince was struck with divine love. With tears of piety, he asked the elder to take him along with them on their way back to the holy mountain. I see, Father, that God, who knows the depth of my heart, sent you to me, a sinner, to guide me to the divine path. So I beg you, teach me how to avoid the vanity of the world and to succeed in the holy life like yours, for soon my parents are planning to marry me off. That is why I have decided to depart from here as soon as possible. The elder accepted him as a traveling companion and guide, for he realized that it was God's will, since he saw Roscoe's soul burning with desire for God while preparing for his escape. In the Russian monastery, Rosco trained in all monastic labors like a good soldier and athlete. His parents, however, were inconsolable. His father sent men everywhere to look for him, for Rosco was not only his well-behaved, beautiful son, but also his heir to the throne. Finally, three Serbian noblemen heard that Rosco was staying in the Russian monastery and went there to bring him back. Novice Rosco pleaded with his elders to taunter him immediately, and that night hid himself in the monastery's towers. Then he wrote a letter to his parents describing the last judgment and eternal hell. The letter touched them so deeply that they decided to become monastics themselves. His mother received the schema in a monastery where she labored, pleasing God, and there she reposed in the Lord. His father gave up his kingdom and passed the throne to his other son, Stephanos. Then he went to Mount Athos, where he met his son, Savas. The joy and piety they felt when they met cannot be described. The former king requested to be tonsured a monk and received the name Simeon. Thus, the natural father became the spiritual son of his own natural son. In 1198, the father and son built the famous Serbian monastery of Hilandari, on land donated to them by the Holy Monastery of Vatopedi, a grant under the golden seal of the Emperor Alexios III. There in Hollandari, both the father and the son were later canonized. The Holy Damianos was indeed worthy of admiration. A friend of St. Cosmas the Zografitan, he led a pure life, laboring in the Holy Monastery of Esvigimenu. He was under the rule never to stay overnight anywhere else but in his own hut. Once he found himself at night near Hilandari in rain and fog, and not knowing where he was because of the dark and heavy rain, he cried out to the Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, save me, for I am perishing. Then an angel of God appeared and snatched him up, and suddenly he found himself safely in front of his own hut. After he reposed in the Lord, the fathers of the monastery smelled a fragrance, coming from his tomb for forty days. 
This fragrance reached the holy monastery, even though it was a mile away from the tomb. Where do you come from, elder? They would ask spiritual father Benjamin from the monastery of Kutlu Musiu, who lived to be 95 and departed to the Lord in 1941. I am a refugee, he would reply, meaning that all human beings are exiles, and this life is passing temporary. About the year 1835, approximately five years after the Turkish occupation had ended, a group of Serdarinis, the civil guards of Manathos, went to a heavily wooded area near the Great Lavra to hunt for wild goats. Suddenly, one morning, they saw a venerable elder outside a cave standing there naked. They said to him, Evlogite Yerondo, bless the Lord. O Kyrios, he replied, and started asking them questions about the holy mountain. How is it? How do the monks spend their time? And so forth. They informed him that it was peaceful everywhere now that the Turkish occupation had ended. Who are these Turks? And what is the Greek revolution? The elderly hermit asked. Don't you know, Yerunda, that we, the Orthodox, shed our blood to be free from the Turks? No, my children, I do not know anything. Here we are seven together, but we do not go anywhere. We do not get any news, replied this earthly angel and heavenly man. After these hunters had been blessed by him, they hurried in amazement to tell the fathers of St. Anne's Skeet all about their encounter. The fathers of the Skeet showed great interest in what the hunters told them. Accompanied by these civil guards, some of the fathers went throughout all of Mount Athos, searching for the cave and the extraordinary elder, neither of which they found. In the Kelion of Holy Trinity in Keries lived Father Kirilos, a sweet man, friendly, and a gentle face. He was very old, had a white beard and a shining countenance. Because of his appearance, one might have supposed him to be the principal of some university, but in actuality, throughout his whole life, he never left Athos. Here among Joachim, the American, who was admirable for his self-inflicted exile and his contempt for all worldly glory, lived in a hut belonging to St. Anne's and named for the birth of the Theotokos. He was my elder's spiritual brother. My elder told us repeatedly about this exceptional man and his exemplary obedience. He had served at the Jerusalem Patriarchate and in the American Army. He was decorated with several medals, which, along with his Archimandrite's cross, he devoted to St. Anne's icon. Coming to Manathos, from America, where he had been a candidate for high ecclesiastical office, he did exemplary obedience under a very strict elder. After first resigning voluntarily from his priesthood so that he might live as a simple monk. Like the ancient ascetics, he grew a long beard which reached the ground. Afflicted with tuberculosis, he reposed in the Lord in 1957. The Hezekist Gregorios lived in total exile in the Archangel Hut at small St. Anne's. He was a Spartan, and he devoted his whole life to constant fasting and prayer. He used to say that he would be cast into hell with Satan because he felt that he did not honor enough the Lord's sacrifice on the cross. Everybody loved him. An aged elder said, How can one tell that a monk has been crucified? Here is Father S. He has been on Manathos for sixty years and has not come out in the world. Then he said again, Praise and flattery are harmful to a monk. A monk who seeks praise is like a man who tries to catch his shadow. And then again he said, A monk under obedience might say, When my elder scolds me, he does not love me. But if he only knew that he is in his elder's heart. A Serbian monk from Hilandari did not leave his cell for 40 years. St. Leontios from Dionysio did not know where the exitor of the monastery was for 75 years until he departed eternally to the Lord. 100 years ago, there lived and reposed in peace in a barren hut of St. Anne's Skeet, a Serbian prince of the family of Vragrovich, called Monk Theoklitos. 
As an ascetic, he labored hard in exile. For this reason, he was blessed with the grace of the all-giving and merciful God. An elder said, A monk, as soon as he leaves this world, places his own family under God's care and forgets them. God has then to take care of them. The monk leaves the small family and becomes a member of Adam's larger family. He does not remember or pray for his own family especially because he knows that God is obligated to look after them. I see my parents, brothers, sisters, nieces, and nephews in every man. I thus don't communicate with my own family. When I do not think of my own, the Lord will. Here a monk Euthemios earned a good reputation as a spiritual guide, a discerning father confessor, and a scholar of many patristic books. He lived in a cell of Kutlumusiu. This ever-memorable monk used to tell the following incident. Quote, After the liberation of Crete in 1912, the Turks were selling properties on the island which they had owned during their occupation. At that time, someone who had a brother on Marathos went to the skeet to ask for some money to buy a property too. His monk brother did not want to give him any money, since he knew that money coming from a monastic does not bring good to relatives. A monk is dedicated to God alone, but finally he was persuaded by his natural brother to give him some money he had. As soon as his brother returned to Thessaloniki, he fell into grave danger. He was robbed of all the money he had received and killed. Elder Bartholomew was born in 1860 on Manathos, where his mother and other women and children had taken refuge during the rebellion of Halkiriki. His mother dedicated him to Panagia. Another one to follow in his footsteps was hero deacon Vasilios Davilas, who died in 1979. He demonstrated such complete denial of the world that he never left Manathos or his cell for 40 years, not even to go to the capital of Keres. In the same way, the natural brothers, Benedictos, Aganthangelos, and Savas, all three from the cell of the Dormition, and their brother, here monk Gregorios of St. Nicholas's cell in Keres, never went back to the world from the time of their tonsure. Here monk Gregorios in fact, came to Manathos when he was only nine years old. He had forgotten what a woman's face looks like, having only the vaguest memory of his own mother. Father Neophytos of St. Anne's, an aged elder who once went out of Manathos just for a short time on urgent business, used to tell me, I pray that Panagi will never allow me to go out into the world again. Chapter 11 on Ascasis. Our pious, God bearing father Peter the Athenite, the first Hezekist on Manathos, lived in a cave in the southern part of the peninsula. There he led a truly angelic, heavenly existence. Without clothes, barefoot, and suffering many varied temptations launched against him by Satan, he for forty three years was fed only with heavenly bread. Righteous Eurontios, the founder of St. Anne's Skeet, was the first Higumun to serve in the monastery of Vulutifrion. At first he lived in caves near the sea. Later, because of the threat of pirate attacks, he moved higher up the rugged cliffs of Athos, where to this day there is a chapel in honor of St. Pentolemon. Many ascetics lived in desolate huts near him, with absolutely no possessions and free of worldly cares. They gave themselves entirely to the labor of prayer. In order to bring some consolation to his brothers, the saintly Eurontios prayed and holy water appeared on the spot where he did his ascetic labors. His successor gathered up all the water from this miraculous spring because he wanted a small garden and he needed the water for it. According to the fathers, Arpanagia did not like this and dried up the spring although another one appeared at another spot below the original one. The Lady Theotokos wanted ascetics to be free of worldly affairs, to devote themselves only to prayer and not to cultivate gardens. The newly manifested St. Eurasimos, who labored on Athos, stayed in Kapsala for five years as an ascetic. He ate only boiled zucchini with no oil. Then he went to 
Homala of Kathalinini Island to his ascetic cell and there built a holy monastery. During the time he lived on Manathos, he gained many spiritual experiences, met pious and saintly men, and completed his monastic training. He became a vessel of grace through ceaseless prayer and fasting. That is why all evil spirits were afraid of him, were cast out by him. His nickname was Kapsalis, after the desolate place of Kapsala. The demons would cry out, Kapsalis, you have burned us. During one very cold winter in which snow fell heavily, our righteous and God-inspired father Akakios, the Kafsokalivitan, lit a fire to warm himself. But as he drew nearer the fire, he felt colder. Then he realized that it was abnormal to feel cold by the fire, and that the cold must be caused by demonic influence. So he put out the fire, went out of his cave, and naked fell into the snow, whereupon he immediately felt very warm, as if he were in a steam bath. We were amazed and surprised each time we visited this saint's cave and saw his bed, which is preserved to this very day. It was made of thick, untrimmed branches nailed in such a way that wide spaces remained between them. It would have been impossible for anyone to rest well on them. St. Savas the Agaritan, an ascetic who was sanctified on the island of Kalimnos, loved ascesis and suffering. He ate food cooked in oil only on weekends. He did the ninth hour prayer every day. When he slept, he slept on a plank, but most nights he spent entirely in prayer. He confessed God's people like a good shepherd who gives his life for his sheep, John 10:11. He was also clairvoyant. He left Manathos for Egina in order to place himself under obedience to St. Nectarios, the miracle worker. St. Nectarios gave him a set of priest's vestments, which he wore only on great feasts. It was St. Savas who served the burial of St. Nectarios. My elder spiritual father was the Krulitan hermit and hero monk, Christophorus. He lived ascetically in a hut, which resembled an eagle's nest. It had a tin roof and was surrounded by steep, bare rocks disappearing into the abyss of the Aegean. There was an endless, cleansing stillness everywhere, interrupted only by the sweet, joyous, joyful cries of wild birds. It was a totally isolated place. Only a few cactus, fig bushes, and some wild almond trees scattered about decorated with a bit of greenery, the barren landscape. In these desolate surroundings, one could admire and contemplate how this crippled spiritual father, Christophoros, came to live near such precipitous and unapproachable ravines. Despite his having only one leg, he would climb, like an athletic mountaineer, up the truly awesome and forbidding Kurulia. My ever-memorable elder many times told me that the fathers in the past times used to travel by sea from both the desolate places and from the monasteries, rowing all the way to Daphne and back. Because this way took a long time, they brought books and incense along with them in order to be able to chant their matins. They chanted or prayed with the prayer ropes as they rowed. In the desert of St. Basil, next to Kerasia, lived Elder Theophylactos a solid gem of asceticism and endurance. He had two monks under obedience to him. He fre frequently went for all-night vigils to a cave. One night, after a heavy snowfall, everything was covered by a foot of snow. When morning came, his monks went looking for him everywhere. After a long search, they saw from a distance a dark object on a cliff. As they came closer, they realized it was their elder, and they feared that he frozen to death. As soon as they touched him, however, he moved. This was a great surprise, and they observed that not only was he alive, but in fact he was emitting such warmth that it was as if his whole body were aflame, and indeed all the snow had melted around him. This same holy ascetic at another time was taken by demons and carried over to St. Basil's desert in Kerulia. An elder said, these days we try to become righteous with very little effort. We have abandoned tradition. We do not look up to those at the top 
and how they came first in the race. We see only those who came last. The marvelous Hezekist Varnavas had neither a room of his own nor any possessions. He used one corner of the reception room to rest. The hermit elder Damaskinos told me all about him. We have been greatly attracted to Dionysiu because of its ascetic, monastic, liturgical, and pioneer Athenite tradition. We feel this bond not only because of its wise and revered abbot Gabriel and the elder Theoclitos Dionysiates, who is known for his many scholarly writings, but above all because of the presence of the most pious elder, Lazarus. Each time we visited Elder Lazarus at his cell for spiritual assistance, we would leave there full of spiritual fruit, as if we had gathered the mystical grapes of monastic experience. The Holy Hegemon Gabriel gave us some brief biographical information ref reflecting the life and experience of this great ascetic and synobiac. Quote, Father Lazarus came from Melevia and Agia Larissa. He was born in 1892, came to Athos in 1916, and died on December 28, 1974. He was the monastery's infirmian for 30 years and served as the Tepacarius, the monk in charge of making sure the order of services followed correctly, for 10 years, and as the monk who supervises the practical running of the monastery's routine for 30 years. Before beginning the monastic life, he had received a high school education and had served as secretary to the Justice of the Peace in Doshan Agius Larissas. At the age of 20, he immigrated to the United States of America. Then he came to Mount Athos when he was 24 and was tantra monk in 1917. He was pious and honest in the extreme, a zealot for Cenobitic monastic life. Very ascetic, he would receive communion every week with the monastery's blessing. He lived in Nifan's hut for three years, higher up from the monastery, where he observed a strict fast and self-restraint. Proof of all this was that in the period of Great Lent, for all the years until 1965, he fasted totally on Mondays and Tuesdays, and on Wednesdays until he had received communion at the pre-sanctified liturgy. After partaking with the fathers of the supper which followed this liturgy, he would then eat nothing else until the following Saturday. When serving in the hospital, he took care not only of the body, but also of the soul, preparing those who were about to depart to the Lord. He had a stroke on Christmas Day and lived for three days following that. He received holy unction and communicated every day until he lapsed into a coma. Soon afterwards, in the afternoon, he reposed in the Lord. Everyone in the Brotherhood mourned him, and to this day his memory has remained vivid among them. St. Nicodemus the Hagiorite was great in the kingdom of God because he not only taught but also practiced asceticism, fasting, deprivation, and blessed poverty, all of which constitute the beauty of monastic life. Here's what his biographer tells us about him. Quote, his love for Hezekiah brought him to the wilderness where he bought the, the cell across from St. Basil's desert. He would get his bread from us and then spend the rest of his time in Hezekiah. Other foods he ate were boiled rice, water with honey, and most of the time he would also eat olives and fava beans. There is now a half-ruined hut in Kutlumusius Skeet dedicated to St. Ioannikios, Yo here lived a group of six fathers under a very strict Yeronda. The hut had only two rooms and a small church. None of the fathers had a room of his own. They all rested during the night by leaning on the upright benches in the church. Such was their deprivation and victory over sleep, these athletes of asceticism. Elder A., the Kafso Kalivitan, is still living. We met him many times. In the past, the fathers did not use animals to transport their loads. Everything was carried on their backs, even up the steepest paths to the skeets. One night, Elder A., with Panagia's help, carried on his back from the docks to their living quarters a ton of grapes. He struggled with the many loads until morning. Another time, he carried 500 containers of sand for building. 
42 times he climbed to Athos's peak, either to help with the building of the Transfiguration Church at the peak or to take part in the vigil which takes place there each August 6th. The ever-memorable Lavriaton Father A. celebrated a litur liturgy daily for 70 years. His knees had calluses from the many prostrations. He foresaw his own death, although he was never ill, even to the end. He blessed the trapeza for the last time, saying goodbye to the fathers and brothers and reposed in the Lord. What can we say about the hermit Chrysogonos, especially regarding his fasting and his passion, eliminating ascases? This blessed man who lived in a hut for workers near the Kutlumusian cell of the Holy Apostles had for his daily food only bread or toast dipped in water with a bit of sugar. His clothes were old, and for bedding he used burlap sacks. He wore five or six of these sacks, and thus went through the whole winter next to the fireplace. He was a simple, quiet monk. A similar impoverished monk was another ascetic of Invigla, whose name is not known. He lived like the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet the Heavenly Father feeds them. Matthew 6.26 he lived in great deprivation in a small hut without a chapel. During the evening services, he would go around to different fathers carrying his lit oil lamp. Only when he had no more oil would he go to the Romanian skeet belonging to Great Lavra. As soon as the fathers there saw his empty lamp, without his having to say anything, they would understand and fill it with oil and give him alms. After the divine liturgy, bashfully, he would eat a very small amount and then depart quickly in prayer. In his hut, he lived like an angel. Footnote, the word in Greek that Father Ioannikios uses here is asarkos, or fleshless. That is, he lived as if he were had no bodily needs, such as the need for food, translators note. To continue. Once only, when I was with my ever-memorable elder, I saw Father Amvelek, whose meek and quiet countenance remains still vivid in my memory. He lived to be over 100 years old and was a contemporary of St. Nectarios and a co-struggler, co a co-ascetic with Elder Joseph the Cave Dweller. His hermitage was in the desert of St. Basil's, above Katanakia, in small St. Anne's, in a cave which now is used as a cooler room. He would ask that no one be named after him since he did not honor himself. For his spiritual benefit, he visited several monasteries in Constantinople, Pontos, Jerusalem, and mainland Greece. If anyone asked, What are you doing, Father? He would reply, We are watchful, meaning that he was in constant vigilance and prayer. Father Ignatius, the discerning spiritual father of desolate Katanakia, was a magnificent example of orthodox monasticism in our century. He proved to be an equal to Father Savas, the elder Kalinikos the Recluse, the elder Eurasimos, and the elder Daniel of Ishmarin. Unwashed, uncombed, barefoot, with only one tunic in his possession, Father Ignatius was the meekest, quietest, and most peaceful of beings, a safe haven to all who came under his epitrachelion to confess. He was a famous spiritual father to both Greeks and non-Greeks alike. The little bit of oil which his company of monks produced from their few olive trees was used only to light the lamps in their chapels. They ate their food oilless. Most of the time, Father Ignatius kept his window shutters closed in order to have more hours of darkness in which to continue his prayers for a longer period of time. He aimed through his spiritual guidance to help people increase divine love in their hearts towards Christ, the bridegroom. He used to say, Love the one who loves you. Toward the end of his life, when he was blind, he devoted himself even more to prayer. It has been said that many times you could smell a fragrance coming from his mouth. They could also sense it from his relics when they were translated. He was a biblical figure. There were many hermits on Manathos who when they were in the world, were people of high status in society, 
and the world of science. Such was the Russian prince and hero monk Parthenios the Kurulutin. At first he lived in St. Nicholas Burazertis Kelion and was the Kelion's secretary. At the time of the church's consecration he received a letter from a Russian countrywoman which made him labor even harder on the formidable Kurulia. In that letter she had written, quote, Please, Holy Father, accept this small amount of money for me. I heard that you are building a church and that you need money. I felt bad that I had no money to send you, so I cut my braided hair and sold it to some noble ladies who wear their hair short but need to have braids for official receptions. Please accept from me this small contribution. Father Parthenios was greatly moved by this incident. As a result, he bravely decided to live like an angel on the cliffs of Kurulia. He would mention this letter frequently and say, When I read the letter, these thoughts came to me. Some cut their hair, and others give from the little bit which they have. And I sit here in comfort. I had to go to Kurulia for the love of Christ and the salvation of my soul. It is said that Father Parthenios's face was bright and that he had the gift of clairvoyance. He slept on the ground of his cave dwelling. His tattered garments emitted fragrance. He gave much to the Lord, his poverty and lack of possessions, but this prince of Russia in return received many rewards in this life, as well as in the life to come. The life of Monk John from the Church of the Archangel at Edessa was equal to the ancient athletes of Ascasis. He lived his holy life forcefully, wearing chains beneath his clothes to create hardship. He avoided contact with people, staying in his small living quarters most of the time, in peace and voluntary poverty. He offered his guests a very tasty rye bread as if it were the best cake. He also gave them cold rainwater which he had gathered in his reservoir. He did not each eat fresh tomatoes or fresh figs and other garden vegetables for over three years because he would not leave his home to go to the Lavra or to the St. Anne's Skeet and he would never ask for anything from his neighbors. Over a period of fifteen years, when he had to go to Kerias to buy rye or other necessary supplies, he would not stay and, and be a burden to any of the brothers. He would spend the night outdoors. The ex-bandit Nikitas from St. Basil's, who was like the grateful robber crucified with Christ, used to say, Praise and thanks be to God and Panagia who never abandoned me. He had been tonsured by the famous spiritual father, Chariton. How do you manage with no money since you are not making any crafts? The elder, ever-memorable Joachim, used to ask him. Praise and thanks be to God. I go to the monastery and ask for a pita bread. When I come back to the hut, I find two or three more there. He would reply in an amazingly candid manner, for which reason he was graced miraculously. When he fell sick and was bedridden, his neighbors, the hermit Damascinos and his accompanying monks, took care of him. Near his end life, he was infested with lice. No sooner was he cleaned by the fathers than he would be covered again from head to toe with them. I was a bandit while in the world, he would frequently say, and I have asked God to let me pay him back for all the things I did. Let the lice eat me alive. We were blessed to meet the ever-memorable hermit Gabriel from Kurulia, a tough fighter and a victorious athlete of self-restraint. Frequently we came across him at St. Anne's Kiriakon or on the way there. He was either silent or in prayer, saying little. To people who did not know him very well, he appeared to be repulsive and removed from the world, but he was removed in a spiritual sense only. Toward the end of his life, we visited him for the last time at his hermitage on formidable Kurulia. There we saw Christ's prize winner, who insistently and despite his pain refused to eat anything cooked in oil. He found a way to make tasteless food, even the oilless food brought to him by the Dan Danalite fathers. He was old when he came to Manathos, having been a policeman in his former civilian life. He lived with his elder for twenty years, and they never ate oil, even on the feast day of Pascha. He communicated the holy mysteries frequently, always with compunction and tears. He kept his shroud bundled up and ready, 
placed it on a shelf and labeled it my shroud. During the 20 days prior to his death, the Danelites cared for him with true love and brotherly sacrifice. They begged him to eat some food cooked in oil, but in spite of the fact that he was dying and had lost most of his strength, he did not break his fasting rule. He tasted no food with oil and passed away in peace. Just before the end, he asked for communion. He was peaceful and full of joy. When he was left alone for a few minutes, he lifted his head up to heaven and cried out, there are flowers, many flowers. How beautiful is paradise. Is the soul worthy of so many beautiful things of such pleasure? Oh, what patience had the wonderful St. Simeon, who went barefoot and only had one tunic to wear. He did his ascetic labors first near the holy monastery of Philotheu, and after that went to Pilion, where he built the Farmurian Monastery. He was made of either stone or steel. He was the most patient, possessionless, but rich in virtues, servant of God, this Simeon. Indeed, he was stronger than a diamond in spirituality, in patience, and in ascases. That is why he managed to go barefoot and wearing the same tunic in winter or summer until the day he reposed in peace. Hermit Philaretos of Carulio wore no shoes. His feet were hardened, and his soles looked like a turtle's shell. On the cliffs, he planted wherever he could find some soil. He raised potatoes, greens, cabbage, and lettuce. These vegetables were his food, and he gave some away as alms to other brothers and fathers. His wooden bed was always made, for he slept mostly on the floor, as was verified after his death. A piece of wood was found under his bed, which he used as a pillow during his short periods of sleep. He had been a lieutenant in the army, leaving behind all worldly glory, honor, and vanity. He slept on the floor in Carulia for twenty years. Known not only for his kindness, but also for his poverty and ascases, he wore the same rasso from the time of his tantra as a monk to the time he slept in the Lord. This garment was patched so many times that its original cloth no longer existed. Elder Eulogios died in 1948. He was from the cell of St. George, the miracle worker, the cell named Farnarmenu of Logison. When still young, Father Eulogios fasted without oil for seven years, and when he was elderly for six years, he had great love for Panagia. While he was a young boy still living in his village, she appeared to him and said, Go and I will always be with you. He lived 80 years of his life on the holy mountain. The well-known ascetic Haji Georges of Athos, when still a novice, spent four years laboring in the cave of the righteous Nephon, the Kafsa Kalivitan. There, in total quietness, fasting, and prayer, he was instructed by his spiritual father, Neophytos, who lived in St. George's hut and frequently visited him to give him holy communion. The ascetic conduct of Haji Georges in Kafso Kalivia and later in Kerasia with his group of monks made history. Because of his fasting at great lengths, he was called the Fasting One. Both he and his monks never cooked or ate non-fasting foods. They ate mainly nuts and honey. At Pascha, they colored boiled potatoes instead of eggs. He never used medication. When any of the brothers had a cold, he lightly warmed up the oven, which was made of bricks and mud, and placed the brother in it, and he would be cured. If anyone had any other ailment, he would stand him in front of Panagia's icon, and together they would pray all night. At the end of the divine liturgy, the sick person took communion and was cured. He had a large group of pious laboring monks around him. Haji Georges owned only one garment and went barefoot. He wore thick woolen socks only when he was in church. There was a Russian ascetic on Manathos whose feet were badly infected, and he never took any medicine for his illness nor accepted any other treatment. I am a monk, he would often say in his Russian style of speaking. I must suffer. The famous spiritual father Ilarion the Ivaritan never ate or drank on Fridays, to honor Christ's crucifixion. 
spiritual father Savas, Ilarion's obedient disciple, was his equal in Ascasis. He ate only once a day, and for the last two years of his life was sustained daily, only from the Holy Communion, left after each liturgy, and with a cup of coffee every afternoon. Every night he prayed in his cell with suspensions. The ever-memorable Joachim Spetseris, knowing the benefits of ascetic hardship, never used heat in the church nor in his cell, even in midwinter. His obedient subordinate, Theophylactos, whom we met several times at Nuskeet, told us about his spiritual father who used to say to him, Father Theophylactos, how did the fathers endure Ascasis, sitting on top of poles under difficult conditions? Did they not feel the cold? Yet we, wrapped in our clothes, feel the cold even in our homes. In these present eschatological times, we are not making brave decisions and superhuman efforts in the ascetic arena of spiritual heroic contestants. Such a contestant in endurance, patience, ascesis, and hardship is our contemporary Romanian ascetic Her Herodianus, who for forty years has been in seclusion in his tiny cell, unclothed, impoverished, but happy and blessed. His entire existence, like a burning candle, is consumed by prayer, silence, and vision. He communicates with his visitors through a small window. Some loving, charitable fathers supply him with what is necessary to live on this spiritual bird of the sky. An elder once said to some sisters, quote, Ascasi should be done to the point that one stays healthy and able to complete any task assigned. Anything done in excess affects the body, and then a person cannot do what is necessary. One should let her spiritual mother know the number of prostrations she is doing. Vigil is superior to fasting, as it helps to purify the mind and creates sweetness in the heart. Sleeping makes one lethargic. We ought to force ourselves in the spiritual life, since we frequently may lose our spiritual appetite. When we make ourselves eat a little bit, we get our appetite back. The same applies when one's arm is dislocated. It won't heal unless it is exercised. A dislocated arm must be forced suddenly back into place. We should not resemble the tortoise that started to go to a wedding and then arrived when the firstborn baby was baptized. I once met two Russian ascetics, Nikodemus and Seraphim, in the holy mountain's most formidable desert, Karulia, where the strictest ascetics live. They were known for their great Lenten fasting, partaking of only one coffee a day and some water. Indeed, works of supermen. There are also many other unknown athletes of the fast who quenched all passions, who existed and still to this day exist in the Athenite arena of purification of the passions, and who are the marvel of both angels and men. In 1969, I received a letter from the hermit D, whom I had asked to provide information to me about what he knew concerning the ascetic endeavors on Athos, so that my readers could see that even in the present age there are giants of asceticism on the holy mountain who are no different from those of old. In his letter, he says the following to me, quote, Certainly in our times such figures exist, as we ourselves have witnessed, men who exert such an influence that they could be a powerful cure to our perverted generation. For example, one author and theologian, a wise scholar, has written about an Athenite monk who for fifty days ate nothing at all, in addition to all his other ascetic labors. The author admired this and praised God for such contestants still existing in our time, men like those we read about in the writings of the Desert Fathers. Moreover, this wise scholar continues, Glory be to God that even now he provides such contestants. I did not doubt when I read such things. Father Ioannikios, I wondered, though, and was asking myself, how is it possible for man to survive without food for 50 days? Fortunately for me, even as I was pondering this, something happened that convinced me that it is possible. An elderly ascetic, possessionless and simple, a little bit older than 60, came to my hut during cheese fair week and fell asleep there after we had dinner together. Next morning, the first day of Great Lent, 
a matter came up, and as I could not go myself, I sent him instead. He gladly went to Vigla, a distance of five hours' walk from here. After he had accomplished his mission, he returned to the hut at night, and I begged him to accept some food and drink because he was an old man and tired, but he refused. I asked him again to eat something on the third day, but he still refused. Then I was amazed and wanted to know how, since he was old and tired from the long walk, he could not feel hungry or thirsty. He replied simply, I did not eat anything last year, during the whole of Great Lent until Palm Sunday, and then only the Holy Communion. I would have been less astounded at that moment if a bomb had exploded in front of me, but I had no reason to doubt his word, since I had talked with him many times and knew him to be a man of truthfulness, modesty, and innocence. He did not suspect that I was going to make this matter known, and so did not try to hide anything from me. I personally attribute this to divine providence. It was revealed to me so that others might benefit from it, especially me, in order to make me humble, I who am unable to fast for even one day. Elder Amvilak from Logovardo's holy monastery in Paros was an ascetic at various locations on Manathos. He had lived near the shore of St. Anne's in a cave where he built a church in honor of the 99 holy fathers of Crete. Then he went to St. Basil's Desert for great ascases and finally settled in the Dormition of the Theotokos' hut of small St. Anne's above Dionysiu and the Mitrophanis Cave. There he labored to the day of his repose at the age of 107. Elder Euromanos from Kafsokolivia slept in the Lord at the age of 105 in 1875. He had arrived on Manathos in 1830 and was under obedience to the elder Daniel, who was lame and lived in the hut of the archangels. When Father Euromanos first arrived there on a Tuesday, there was nothing for him to eat. My child, said one of the spiritual fathers, go to Elder Daniel, who is ill and has nothing. Yes, Father, Elder Euromanos replied, he may have nothing and be poor and lame, but I do not need an elder to feed me. I need an elder to guide my soul. So Father Euromanos went to Elder Daniel and stayed with him, enduring patiently and with love the many hardships of their life. Two years later, in addition to being handicapped, Elder Daniel lost his sight. Like a good, obedient monk, Father Yermanos cared for him in his old age and finally buried him. After thirty years in Kafsokolivia, he went to Charai, to the hermitage where the Romanian Eurasimos led his ascetic life. The Russian hero monk Parthenios, despite his royal descent, led a strict ascetic life in Karulia. He did not cook, but ate only dry foods. He used no heat in winter and had no bed. Instead, he slept on a hide, and for a pillow, he used a tree stump. He was polite, friendly, and above all, charitable. Spiritual Father B. used to say that fasting is the mother of good health, for he once said to a doctor, I fast, and you do not. Let us have a race walking. Spirituality changes a man, turns him into steel. He ate only once a day. A hot drink was his only sustenance at night. He fasted for all of Great Lent, drinking only broth from boiled greens and one glass of wine. He lived in Agina near St. Nectarios for twelve years. He used to harness himself to the well wheel in order to draw water. I remember that the most pious Ivaratan hero monk Athanasios never wore heavy socks over the course of the whole winter. He lived in the idiorhythmic style of monasticism, where each monk cooks his own meals separately, but he never actually cooked at all. Instead, he simply ate a small portion of whatever was served to guests in the reception room. Before he received an inner spiritual illumination, and as a result returned to his homeland of Cyprus, hero monk Kiprianos, who lived 1880 to 1955, lived on Athos for a thousand days beginning in 1905. While on the holy mountain, he led a very ascetic life, with voluntary suffering and deprivation, in Simonopetra's monastery, and then in Katanakia. He slept only four hours a day, 
His north-facing room had no heat, nor did he have extra blankets. He owned just one pair of slippers his entire life. He did not wash for fifty years. He was sanctified through illness and nurtured by pain. After he lost his voice, he prayed endlessly with raised arms until they would fall down from his exhaustion. We also met the most simple, meek, and kind hermit, Farnurios, a Romanian who had his hermitage in a bushy area inhabited by Hezekists near Holy Pantocrator's monastery, an area named for St. The Theophilus the Murgusher. There are still many ruined huts in this area where various Holy Fathers lived and labored and fought against the invisible powers of darkness and were victorious over them. Contemporary monks have frequently discovered such nests, dwellings, burrows, and caves, places in which one wonders how it would be possible for these earthly angels and heavenly men to dwell. In the desolate hut, which is part of the cave of St. Peter, the first Athenite, lived the hermits Chrysostomos and his obedient monk, who led there an unsurpassed ascetic life. They wore tattered clothes, went barefoot, and fed on dry bread and chestnuts or whatever else was sent to them from Lavra. In spite of their unkempt and sad appearance, their faces shone with heavenly radiance and sweetness. All this was witnessed and recorded by Dionysios the Lavriton, the bishop of Trichis and Stagon, who ordained me as deacon, and who frequently with his elder visited the spiritual arena of St. Peter's cave. Nuskeet's elder Chrysostomos endured ascesis and illness patiently. In spite of the doctor's orders for him to take some meat broth, he replied, I'd rather die. It is not allowed by the Skeet's rules. Finally, by God's grace, he recovered. St. Siloanos the Athenite used to tell us, quote, Here's what happened to me in the Metochion. I would eat until I was full. Two hours later I'd be hungry again. I began to weigh myself, and strangely enough, I saw what I had gained. Three okas in three days. An oka equals 708.5 grams. I realized then that this was temptation, for we monks ought to starve our bodies. There are passions of the body which hinder prayer, and God's spirit is not present when one's stomach is full. One ought to know from experience the limits of fasting so that his body is not weakened to the point of being unable to fulfill his obedience. Father Euthymios, who had been previously married, lived with his obedient monk, Father Matthew, for sixteen years in the unapproachable cave of St. Nilos the Murgusher. After his wife had reposed, he had come to Mount Athos to become a monk. At first he served as Lavra's spiritual father, laboring in the cave of St. Athanasios the Athenite. Then he went to St. Nilos, the Murgusher's cave. He had come from Konitsa in Epirus. Elder Methodius, now an aged man, had served him. He told us the following, Father Euthemios used to wear an undershirt coated with wax. Elder Methodius would carry him on his back up the steep steps to St. Nilos's Holy Kelion. What can we say about Father Velaratos, who experienced great force on himself? Even on the feast day of Pascha, he never omitted reading the ninth hour. His Eminence Archbishop Timothy of Crete wrote about a hermit elder Amvalek. He was as solemn as a prophet, as meek as an apostle, and he stood tall, this heavy set ascetic. He reminded us with his presence of those great desert fathers who were filled with grace. There was a monk of St. Paul's named Eurasimos. He worked as a tireless Tipacarius for forty years. The most amazing thing about him was that he never sat down during any of the long services and vigils. He remained a steadfast pillar of patience in spite of the fact that he suffered from a double hernia. What was the reason for this diamond heart attitude? For many days he had observed a tame sparrow up on a tree limb standing on one leg, singing melodiously all day long, praising the Creator of all things, but always standing on one leg. This ever memorable one used to say, if a disabled and weak bird can stand on only one leg all its life, 
What then ought I to do during the divine liturgy when praises are sung to the Lord? Such was his awareness and watchfulness of himself, that he would not undress for bed at night, but would sleep in his monastic habit. Elder Joseph the Hezekist was like a catapult against any self-love. He never spared himself, persevering in all ascetic labors. Usually each year, immediately after the feast day of Pascha was over, following a winter of seclusion in their hut, he and his ascetic co companion, Father Arsenios, would go to the top of Manathos. Most of the time while there, they stayed in their beloved chapel of Panagia below the mountain's peak. Their drinking water was snow boiled in the copper pot they had brought in their knapsack. They fed on boiled greens and bulbs. At that location, 2,000 meters above the sea, the winds were very strong. To protect themselves, they spent the night sheltered in ravines and caves, where if necessary they used the capes they wore instead of rassos as blankets. Father Arsenios told us that they often did their prostrations standing barefoot in the snow in order to overcome sleepiness. Once during these ascetic wanderings, they stayed in the remote chapel above Great Lavra, where St. Gregory Palamas, teacher of the Jesus Prayer, preacher of grace, and defender of monasticism, did his ascetic labors. One night while they were praying, demons started a great disturbance, shouting, You have burned us, you have burned us, go away from here, and swearing with vile words. Father Arseni, who had heard them this time as well, asked in his usual simple manner, What are they screaming about? Who are they? They are temptations, Elder Joseph replied. I not only hear them, I also see them. Be calm. They are bothered by what we are doing. Beneath the Holy Trinity hut of St. Anne's Skeet, there is St. Demetrius's cell. This is where Father Benjamin from Grigoriu came to be a hesychist. He was of such strong constitution that he wore a wet undershirt all night long. Everyone was amazed at that and expected him to get sick with tuberculosis, but he endured like steel. He also attended all services, standing up, which made him resemble a candle holder at the church's entrance. He washed neither his face nor his feet. At any group work, he ran first to lift the heaviest load. He many times went without food, even though he was a member of St. Gregory's Monastery. Joyfully, he labored beyond the call of obedience. The ever-memorable Father Minas was greatly respected by many in this skeet who made their confessions to him. Among them was a monk named Antimos, who wore the angelic schema. He, while still in the world, had traveled frequently through areas occupied by Turks. There he was circumcised three times by three different muzines, hojas. Father Minas did not know what penance to give for this. So he would only say to him, Be patient now that you are here. St. Anne will help you be saved. He obeyed the elder, but Satan, because of envy, launched a severe carnal war against him through lustful memories of the world. With tears, he pleaded with Father Minas to pray for him, to St. Anne to deliver him from this attack. Father Minas then placed a penance on him of carrying on his back barrels, which weighed 100 okas each, from the dock to the skeet. On the way, he would hardly stop to catch his breath. The only time he paused was to rest bri briefly at the point where St. Athanasius's cross is, and there, with weeping eyes, he, placed, he pleaded with the saint to free him from Satan's attacks. Then he continued the rest of the way to the skeet. Any time the blessed elder saw him, he would run to assist him and give his fatherly advice on his spiritual struggles. Thus, the all-merciful God, seeing his effort and his innocent return to orthodoxy, as well as his sincere confession, blessed him to reach a state of true repentance, so that shortly after this he departed to the Lord, fully prepared. Any time Father Minas remembered him, he would say, Thanks be to God that he completed the race in a state of repentance and having confessed. In Carcia, we met and were blessed by the most reverend spiritual father, Herotheus, 
who succeeded Haji Georges, the one famous for fasting. He told us all about Haji Georges' letter to the Bishop of Chios, and which was an account of his and his disciples' ascetic endeavors. In that letter, the great ascetic insistently explained his views to the bishop that by fasting on Saturday and Sunday as well as on the feast day of Pascha, he did not ignore the holy canons. I take the following from my diary. October 5, 1968. This morning I set out from St. Anne's Skeet to visit the Kurlatin ascetic elder Gabriel, who for two months now has been bedridden. His hut is suspended in Kurulia, like an eternal oil lamp in the sanctuary of the Holy Mountains Desert. I entered through the first door carefully. Beneath the small landing there was a chasm, a precipice. I opened the second door, saying, through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, and entered. Now I came across not the Father Gabriel I had always known, never still, always energetic, as if he were made of steel, who carried all the gravel during the night to cover the desolate path. Now he groaned constantly. He was paralyzed from the waist down. He tried to say something, but barely managed to utter a word. He was in unbearable pain. What can I say to you now, my father? I am in pain, he replied to my request, that he say something beneficial to me. Make no effort, elder. I understand. I came for your blessing and a promise. If you find a presence before God, do not forget me. I, to find a presence, the unworthy Gabriel, such a thing would not be possible, and he continued moaning in pain. He was like a skeleton. He refused to eat some food cooked in oil which might have strengthened him. I saw a plate with boiled potatoes which the Danelite fathers had brought to him, placed on a barrel filled with feces. I tried to remove it from there. Leave it there, he ordered sternly. It appeared that he always did things this way this philosopher of the desert, so that he might resist gluttony. He simply would not eat, so as not to break his fast. His food had been oilless for years, so that he could receive communion three or four times a week. I dared to say to him, Yerunda, if you could have an injection, it might help. An injection? he said, and looked at me sternly, with his eyes wide open. He had never taken any medication. He trusted himself entirely to the hands of his beloved God and waited in great suffering to meet him. I am waiting for death at any moment. May our Panagia grant you patience, Elder, I replied. I received his blessing, was filled with emotion, and all the way back prayed for heroic Elder Gabriel. Pious Elder Nicandros from Constamanitu refused to become an administrator because he was a humble man who wanted no position of authority. When he came to Manathos, he brought a lot of money with him by which he was tempted a great deal. He felt better as soon as he got rid of it. He became free. He persevered in Ascasis. He was an infirmian and helped in the kitchen, surprising everyone. Though he was old, he worked hard with enthusiasm and energy. Despite the fact that he was aged and sick, even when he was in St. Anthony's Kathisma, he would read Vespers lying in bed under his covers, and during the night he would sense his guardian angel near him, holding him and urging him, saying, Keep on with your rule on obedience. One contemporary hermit of Kapsala, Elder Methodius, a disciple of the great ascetic, Father Tikhon, used to tell me, Father Tikhon would not allow us to throw out the fish bones. He would use them over and over again, boiling them and making the broth into a soup. Chapter 12 On Women's Temperament, Jealousy and Self-Love Our contemporary venerable elder Paisios once said to a group of women monastics, quote, when one keeps himself away from futile things, his thoughts automatically turn to God. It has been easier for women to try to please God because of their sensitive hearts than it has been for men who are rational thinkers. Led by their feelings, women proceeded to Golgotha and to the Holy Sepulchre while the men hid themselves away. But women can be in danger of wasting their emotions on small, vain things. 
it is easy to give your heart to small vanities, such that there is nothing left over for Christ. You can easily not be satisfied with the simple necessities and desire instead those things which are beautiful, ornate, and pleasant. You would thus prefer a little flower to be painted on a glass, a tablecloth embroidered, chairs to be carved, and so forth. In this way the heart is dispersed. Do not waste your heart foolishly. Women in their practical daily lives love such fine detail, just as they do in their spiritual lives also. But wasting their energies on the fine details in the practical realm allows Satan to do his own meticulous destructive work. Do not attach yourselves to ephemeral things, but only to God. Do not become lost in the sea of detail. Rather, simplify your spiritual struggle first, and do not despair. After your large passions are cut off, the small ones will disappear also. Do not dwell on your past life and your childhood transgressions, for new opportunities are available for all. Always give praise and thanks to God. Ingratitude is the worst sin of all, and the worst sinner is an ungrateful one. Father Paisios also said, Women are full of love, but Satan can poison that love and turn it to envy. Women can love themselves excessively. Such love creates suffering, and it becomes a torment. Without such self-love, one turns to Christ, and thus can love everyone. And he said, A jealous man avoids the person he envies. A jealous woman cannot rest until her adversary is totally wiped out. Father Paisios also said that, Underneath human adversity, God's harmony is hidden. For example, in a marriage, two totally different personalities can experience harmony. Thus, women with their emotional wealth can bring men nearer to God. Discernment of Thought and Spirituality The famous hesychist and confessor, Father Gregorios, lived in a small St. Anne's before this time of Father Savas. He was given to frequent silence and constant prayer. He spoke only when necessary, and everyone marveled at his divine gift of fluent, inspired speech. He became the stronghold and support of Cenobitic monks, hermits, and lay pilgrims. This wisest of spiritual fathers, because of his discernment, led to repentance Captain Grigorakis, the leader of a robber band. He managed to do this by using an admirable strategy. He pretended that he too was guilty of many crimes which were even greater than that of the bandits. By this ruse, he gained the trust and confidence of the ferocious Grigorakis, and thus tamed him and brought him around to a complete change of heart. He also promised to give the bandit Holy Communion every day under one condition, that they both would fast for forty days. Grigorakis agreed. Father Gregorios did not give him the actual holy gifts, however, but ordinary bread and wine, until the forty-day penance was finished. Then he gave them the real communion. The Egemen of St. Dionysius, Elder Gabriel, told me this story, quote, Over fifty years ago, near Kyries, in Kutlumasios Skeet, lived an elder and father confessor who was simple-mannered and with little education, but with a cleansed mind, which had been applied carefully to the study of God's word. His obedience was to knit garters, which were worn by the civil guards of Manathos and the mountain people of Rumeli and Epiros. When he came to Keres to sell his product on Saturdays for the weekly market, he would stand under the cemetery shed near the main road, holding his prayer rope in his right hand and his crafts in his left. With his eyes always turned downward, he uttered the Jesus prayer unceasingly. Lord Jesus, have mercy on us. If anyone teased him and said, Look around for some customers, he would reply, As long as they see me, it is not necessary for me to look at them. They say this man of discernment had such perception that he could clearly see the underlying fault of a person in confession and then concisely and laconically give him instructions for correction. Having heard about him, ecumenical patriarch Joachim III, who at that time was staying on Manathos, went to Kyrias to meet him. 
He approached the elder and asked to go to his hut that afternoon in order to make his confession. My hut is too small, your holiness, to receive a patriarch, the elder replied. It does not matter if it is small, the patriarch answered, but it is too low for you to pass under, your holiness. I will stoop down to enter, repeated the great patriarch. Unfortunately, you do not bow, said the elder. If you had put your head down, you could have been a patriarch a long time ago. He meant that the patriarch was arrogant and had an unyielding attitude. Many times the patriarch would say about that incident, As long as I live, I will never forget my discussion with that elder, a simple man, but one of great discernment. To this same spiritual father came another elder who was complaining that his young monk in obedience, even though everything was easy for him and he was not burdened with much work, since he had only his rule of prayer, was nevertheless overcome by many anxious thoughts and therefore in danger of spiritual confusion because of depression. This elder who was in charge of him had come to Elder Gabriel to seek advice and to help in the matter. Marry him off, the elder replied. When he heard this, he was dumbfounded and looked at him in amazement, as if he had heard nothing. Put him to work, the elder repeated. Young people can be humbled and can be quieted down only through regular work. For a monk, prayer only without work is the same as work without prayer. Marry him to his work. Anytime there are temptations and troubles, there are also laurels of victory, the pious elder Gregorios would say to hear a monk Joachim Spetseris. Then he would add, If it were possible to find a monastery filled with angels, and they placed you as one of the brothers in it, still you would not be saved, because no one would bother you, and you would be living an easy life, and this, and this saying would be suitable to your situation. In your lifetime you received your good things. My father, I am losing the battle in a carnal war, here monk Joachim Spetseris told Elder Gregorius once. I cannot rest either day or night. Do not despair, he replied. This is a sign that rewards are near. Do not be afraid. Our Christ does not allow for us to be tempted more than we can endure. And soon after he blessed him, he was freed from the temptation. An elder said that Haji Georges, because he was a novice once himself, understood monks in obedience. Quote, he pruned carefully and clipped with discernment. A hermit said, When you pay back all your debts in this life, you can be saved. However, if you are hit on the head many times, you receive a bit of an extra reward. For an unjustly beaten person, there is a pure reward. This means that Frequently, God permits those who lead good lives to be badly afflicted. Why is this so? Let me explain with an example. There is a happy family where all its members are good, father, mother, and children. They are churchgoers and receive communion regularly. Suddenly, a drunkard or crazy person kills the good father of the family for no reason. Because of this, many people who have been distanced from God, they say, Look, look at him. You see, he was a churchgoer, and this is what happened to him? What insolence! God allows those who are not at fault to suffer in order to give a second chance to the unrepentant, that they might be brought to repentance through seeing the suffering of the innocent, and thus be like the good thief who is hanged next to Christ on the cross. What do we observe in those two robbers between whom the Lord was crucified? One blasphemed against Christ, saying, if you, are like, if you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, we are, we are receiving the just reward for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Do you not even fear God? Luke 23, verses 39 and following. This is why God allows some innocent people to suffer, so that the insolent ones may benefit, although those who suffer are truly God's beloved. In paradise, I believe that God will say to them, Here, this mansion is for you, or you can choose anyone you like. Do you understand? This is the way it is. When we ask to be justified, we may lose everything. We lose our peace of mind and our reward. 
One of the most illumined and discerning fathers of Manathos was Elder Daniel, who built for the Hagiaritan fathers a holy hut in Katanakia's desert. There his group of monks in obedience were named after him, the Danelites, because of their elders' rare and charismatic personality. He became famous as a wise spiritual guide to many Cenobitic monks, hermits, and laypeople because of his virtue and his education, which came from experience. Inspired by the Holy Spirit, he was especially able to discern whatever traps and ambushes were set by evil spirits, who, in the warfare launched by Satan, come from the right. Footnote, a common expression of orthodox monasticism from the right refers to all the evil one's attempts to mislead a person into believing that he has virtues which he does not have. To continue, these temptations from the right include all actions of a person which display false virtues, delusions, exaggerations, actions without a blessing, boasting, and vanity. All these lead to satanic pride. One of those brothers who was misled by Satan was the Constamanitu father Damaskinos. He thought that he would become a recluse, like one of the heroic ascetics, without asking his hegumen's blessing. He decided not to go out of the monastery at all. He went from his cell only to the church and the trapeze, and he completed his obedience, his tasks as assigned. He spent ten years of his life thinking he was a recluse, but filled with such pride. Meanwhile, because he thought himself so virtuous, his pride was increasing along with contempt for others, criticism, and disputes and quarrels with the rest of the monks. Because the problem was not being corrected, the Igumun sent for the revered Elder Daniel, who came willingly because he was always ready to help. The discerning Father Daniel called to himself the deluded Damascinos, and with a characteristically sweet manner, reasoned with him, and slowly brought him to his senses and to repentance. Father Daniel used examples from the Old and New Testaments, Moses, the Israelites, and the fathers, and said to him, Brother, be careful from now on not to trust yourself in your own thoughts, but repeat that wise saying of Abu Dorotheus, Cursed be your thoughts and the knowledge you create. The elders of Manatho say, Not the place, but how you behave saves you. An elder said, We ought to be happy rather than sad when we are unjustly mistreated. We must not try to be justified by people even when we are right. Since God is just and we are focusing on the life to come, it does not make sense to try to have the understanding of others or to be treated well or to be recognized for what we are worth and not to be treated unjustly and so forth. If we follow that route in this life, we have to realize that the path we follow will not lead to paradise. An illiterate and simple hermit told me, those who are too clever are quickly caught in Satan's web because they are filled with ego, my blessed father. They are like crabs caught in a fishing net. Some time ago I met a Cenobitic monk who spoke in a wonderfully expressive way. He talked about the fear of God, about piety, and about human logic. Never before in my life had I met anyone who could express himself in such a vivid way. His words were like a spring of water gushing forth. His speech was exact, pure, fiery, and accompanied with graceful and spontaneous gestures. He would say su such things as, A person who is respectful fears God. One who fears God is also humble. God watches over the humble. Only the humble person is logical. The arrogant person is illogical. And he who does not care for his soul either becomes brutal, turns into a beast, or is filled with self-delusion. What is monasticism? Hard work, an experienced elder replied. Indeed, said a contemporary ascetic to a newly drafted soldier of Christ, if you wish to be successful in the monastic calling, I have only one thing to say to you, my child. Make sure you love physical labor. The greatest hesychist, Charitan the Confessor, 
Any time he received a guest, which he did with much love and kindness, used to say, At that time Christ began to work and to preach. He avoided idle talk and chatter as if they were the cause of countless evils and ills. A respected monk from Nuskeet would say to me, On every feast day of Pascha, when we say, Christos Anesti, we commemorate the angel's proclamation in front of the empty tomb of Christ. Those who leave the church immediately after Christos Anesti is sung are not Christians. The ones who remain to celebrate the divine liturgy are the Christians. Elder Gregorios from Xenophanto Skeet, a monk who is over a hundred years old, told us, When we were beginner monks, we would ask our spiritual father to read us a prayer in church for our passions of idle talk. He also said, a monk without a rule of obedience is not a monk. Monastics who live the iterhythmic style of life cannot be corrected. The pious Lavaratan elder Theophilus used to say, wanting in this way to describe to us all the bad aspects of such monasteries. Admirable monk Theophilactos from Kafso Kalivia said to a young novice, If you wish to be a good monk, remember this through all your life. Praise God for your having been deprived of all expected individual rights. Use a wooden bed to sleep on. On the feast day of Pascha, eat one sardine and some greens with a spoonful of oil. A monastic has no rights in this life so that he can be free. How many the devil has destroyed by attacking them with the passion of wanting individual rights? An elder said, The more spiritual a person is, the fewer rights he wants in this life. We asked an elder how many years he'd been on the holy mountain, and he replied, I have been here many years, but have made no progress. Jackals who live in the wilderness always remain jackals. An old ascetic said, A God-fearing person respects everyone. My elder bowed with respect even to the most insignificant and unworthy person. An elder said, People have distanced themselves from their spiritual fathers and lost themselves in thoughts and various passions so that they end up making their confession to a psychiatrist who feeds them with pills in order to forget their problems. Shortly afterwards, the same problems resurface and everything is repeated all over again. If a person takes care of his inner state, however, he can sleep like a lamb and he does not need pills or anything else. Living in a desert does not do a thing unless I, being in the desert, have also abandoned my passions. Or again, that place is not a desert when I adjust it to my ways instead of adjusting myself to being in the desert. An elder said, God does not predestine, but he does have foreknowledge. An elder said, when you express your opinion to others, do it so that they can be benefited from it. If you are going to chatter, do it only with God. No person can get tired when talking to him, for praying is restful. Many times we pray for someone who is ill, and others are praying for him also, and despite this, the person dies, and those who have prayed for him wonder why God did not hear their prayers. They do not realize that God did hear them, but that he knew what would be best. We do not know what would have been the outcome of that person's life had he lived. We should praise God for everything. An old monk said, The cliffs have become palaces for monks, and the sky is the roof covering them. The ground is their mattress, and their food is nuts and wild greens. The untamed beasts are their neighbors. The caves become royal chambers. Elder, is it difficult to be a monastic? We asked a wise monk. It is not difficult, he replied, when you have forgotten yourself entirely, then you realize that it is the easiest burden to carry. An elder said, for anyone to obtain help, he needs to have his ear receivers turned on in order to receive someone else's signals. When the heart is not receptive, one must ask God to turn it on first, so that his divine word can be received. Approach those distanced from God with a simple manner, humility, and genuine love. 
pretend that you do not see most of the things that are wrong with them, and correct only what is absolutely necessary, because people are weary and burdened with life, and do not like to be corrected by anyone, no matter how well-intentioned. Priesthood is given as a manifestation of God's love for mankind, said Ivaratan Hira Magathanasios. God loved us and made us his priests. A priestly celebrant loans his voice and hands to God to perform his holy mysteries. A priest is cleansed by God's grace when clothed in his vestments, unless there is a moral shortcoming, vindictiveness, or greed for money. Those who labor for God's word should first be ascetically prepared. Before, barefoot elder Avakum would say to all spiritual fathers, giving advice is a holy matter because it is where two minds meet in love and humility. He especially emphasized that any counseling ought to be done with an abundance of love, humility, tolerance, and peace, no matter at what time of the day a person might come seeking help. Monks, he insisted, ought to welcome everyone with a smile so that visitors will depart pleased and glorifying God. An elder said, We should not put God in a difficult position. He is all love. God does not like to see us unhappy. What should God do then? Any time we are given grace abundantly, we boast. If we are not given this grace, we are unhappy, even despairing. Soon after we begin to try to live the spiritual life, we get tired. Even if we go astray, this can be a helpful experience for us because it is only in order to humble us that God sometimes withdraws his grace from us. This, in fact, is exactly how a man is humbled. Then when God's grace is given back to him again, he sees that he has grown in self-knowledge and realizes that he cannot rely on himself, but that he needs God's help. It is like a baby. As soon as he is able to hold his mother's hand, he tries to walk. He takes big steps and thinks that he is doing just fine, imagining that he is walking on his own. If this continues, the child becomes dependent, because if we hold his hand all the time, he gets a false sense of security, and then tumbles when he actually does not attempt to walk by himself, when he does attempt to walk by himself. Sometimes the devil manages to use us to tempt our brother. When we pray for God to give us love, God then might allow our brother to become ill, so that we may be granted an opportunity to show our love when the sick brother asks for help. The sick one might ask you, bring me some tea, bring me this, bring me that. In this way, God will test both your love and your patience. Sometimes God withdraws the grace from our superiors and they speak to us abruptly. This tests us to see if we will judge or not. We who have previously asked him to give us the virtue of restraint from criticism. A discerning contemporary aged father said, we do not speak on behalf of freedom when we say to others that everything is permitted. This is slavery. Only through difficulties can one gain progress. Here's an example. We have a young tree. We take care of it. We tie it to a post with rope. We do not use wire for that would harm it, but we do put a gentle restriction around it. This is the only way to take care of it. Here's another case, a small child. We restrict his freedom from his very conception, because for nine months he lives within the confinements of his mother's womb. After his birth, he is wrapped in swaddling clothes. As he grows, a gate is placed around him, and so forth. These restrictions are necessary until the child is more mature. Outwardly, his freedom is taken away, but without any protection, the child might not have lived to grow up. The grace-filled elder Avakum from Lavra would say, Joy comes from one's relationship and union with God. Mankind has been created to be joyful, not sad. When you enjoy the wrong things, you will inevitably pay back for all this pleasure you have had. But God's joy demands no repayment. For instance, I, who own nothing in this world, cannot pay for the happiness I have. I am not the only one proclaiming this truth. My brother monks who also have nothing else besides God, are filled with joy. I have emptied myself for Christ's sake. I have nothing but my Lord and joy. 
Poverty is beautiful, for it sets you free. One should empty himself to make room for Christ to enter his heart. When the Lord is with me, there is my happiness also. In each ascetic cave you will find spiritual joy. An old ascetic told a group of priests who visited him that to allow time for prayer, one should not spend time on anything that can be looked after by someone else. For example, a doctor does not deal with gauzes and bandages because the nurse can do that. The doctor takes care of the more serious matters, such as examining a patient or performing an operation. If he spends time on minor things, he will not have time for the important ones, and no one will benefit from his medical expertise. The same applies to you. Pray for your parishioners, and underline the names of those who are in greater need than others. It helps to know what each particular person's problem is so that you can pray better for each case. An elderly ascetic advised a priest in the following way, Try as hard as you can to improve yourself and to become a better priest. Then you will see that your parishioners will follow your example without your having to say anything to them. By this you will see that working on improving yourself becomes a silent example for others. The same ascetic also said, We should gradually introduce a person to good thoughts. Then everything else will be fine. A person is under demonic influence if there are no good thoughts. We must turn the right switch on. When we have everything on the same wavelength, then we can benefit by listening as long as the right switch is on. Young people who start a spiritual life should focus on the underlying causes of sin and should try always to have good thoughts. An old ascetic once went to the city for some errand, and when he returned to his skeet, the other brothers asked him what they had seen in the city. He said he had seen no people only wild trees. Nowadays, people want to become saints with no effort, and some of them say, all theological teachings should be put through a patristic sieve. Actually, we ought to sift everything through the Father's teachings and throw out whatever is garbage. We should research according to the Father's. I will demonstrate with an example. We have copper, bronze, and gold. These metals are of different quality. We have 12 karat gold and we have 24 karat. We choose the 24 karat. We need the cheaper metals too, but let us choose gold. A monk who lived in Holy Trinity's hut of St. Anne's Skeet was attacked by the demon of sloth to the point of desperation. One day in his discouragement he said, I will climb up and sit at the edge of a cliff and swing my legs to pass the time. It was the eve of St. John the Baptist's feast day, celebrated at St. Dionysius' monastery. He climbed up and sat on the edge of a cliff and started swinging his legs while murmuring the Jesus prayer, but not all the time, of course, just now and then, since he was full of demonic sloth. While he was sitting there in this lazy manner, a battalion of demons passed by, headed for St. Dionysius' monastery to tempt the monks there. One of the demons said to the others, I will mock that half-dead body in black which is sitting up there. Don't go, he'll burn you, said the other demons. But that demon went away and appeared as a monk before the novice and said, What are you doing here? Not much, replied the young monk. I am lazy, un unable to offer anything to my Lord except to sit here and swing my legs. Hearing these humble words, the demon left him immediately and returned to join his group. This event has been passed down by elders who advise young novices who are having difficulties keeping up their rules of obedience. An old hesychist would say, A person's mind and heart cannot be cleansed when focused on the world and its affairs. Katanakian hermit by the name of Raphael would say this to himself over and over again. Everything on earth is temporary, but all things above are for eternity. An elder said, For a monk, the experience of the world is like a person handling coal. He meant that the world makes one's soul dirty. Another time, an elder said, The fact that monasticism 
is blossoming in our times is an indication that God is preparing something great for the world. The whole world is in crisis. People are thirsty for spiritual things. An elder would say to novices, when we come to stay in a monastery, we should leave the world behind us along with its habits, comforts, and luxuries. An elder said, the spiritual life of a monk starts when he distances himself from all visible and invisible things and focuses entirely on God. And he also said, when I was still in the world, everyone called me monk. So I said to myself, since you are a monk, what are you still doing in the world? Monk Michael the Laverton, an infirmian in Lavra, was an example for his energy and good service. He would finish celebrating the liturgy to the very end in all its detail. He would work anywhere at any time. He was pale and had a shining ascetic appearance. Hermit Elder Damaskinos from St. Basil told us about a monk from Kafso Calivia who lived a long time ago. He had neglected his rule of obedience and other spiritual duties. At the end of his life of sloth and neglect, he fell ill, and while he was dying, his soul for many days would not leave his body. This happened in 1935 to 1936. The doctor, a discerning monk, realized that this was happening to him because he had been careless through all his life. Then Father Gregorios, the dying monk's spiritual father, knelt down and prayed fervently with compassion and love for his subordinate, and promised before God and man that he would fulfill the monk's rule in all its completeness. As he ended his prayer, that very moment, the dying monk reposed peacefully. A monk said, These days we try to achieve sainthood with very little effort. And he said again, The harder you try, the more grace you receive. Then he added, God could fill our hearts with so much bliss and love for him that we might not be able to endure it and would flee the monasteries seeking seclusion in a cave. And lay people, if they experience such a degree of bliss, might abandon their responsibilities, their families, and their children and hide away from them. This is why God, who is all love, does not fill us totally with his bliss. An elder said, People are so stressed these days, they will not find real happiness in parties and worldly entertainment. And he also said, in our times, tradition is gone. All the saints should be our only examples. Another elder said, if your spiritual father gives evidence of denying himself, accept all his advice. If you do not tell him everything, he cannot give you the right advice for you. The Lord says, if a prophet has been deceived, I am responsible for it, for your heart is not set straight. Don't be two-faced. An elder said, I am unable to describe to you, my son, the kind of joy I felt every time I was unjustly treated by men. I felt that I was sharing the injustice that Christ suffered. There was once a Cenobitic monk who was a careless. In spite of this, his hugoman put up with him, wishing the monk salvation saying that Panagia will save him since he has never left her garden. It was obvious that the Hugoman's hope was based on the monk's original zeal and piety. Through his hard work, Elder Ignatius of Dionysiu turned the rugged mountainside into a real orchard, a fruitful olive grove. He always carried an axe in his belt and some tools in his knapsack, and with enthusiasm he cleared the forest area on the mountainside across from his monastery. He grafted all the wild olive trees. It was because of his interest and zeal for the monastery's progress that he left behind this legacy. It is also worth mentioning that his hard work on the olive grove was always accompanied by blessed humility and works of charity. Carelessness can destroy pious men, a horrible thing, an experienced ascetic elder exclaimed. In St. Paul's Holy Monastery, we met a distinguished Romanian hero monk and confessor, Father Makarios, who would say that those who are able to pray with a cleansed heart are those who labor and are participants in the Holy Mysteries. A pious monk advised, Love everyone, 
but have no particular friendship with anyone. I knew a monk who never put his prayer rope down. He prayed unceasingly, anytime and everywhere he went. God had given him an endless desire for prayer in his heart. This is what the white-bearded Cenobitic hero monk S. would say. Once there were 8,000 monks on Manathos, and in spite of all difficulties which existed then, hard work and endless ascetic labors, we had everything. Now the young monks even have cars. Their anxieties and worries for material possessions are like an epidemic. The more they have, the more trouble is present. It is a vicious circle. The cause of this, he continued, is sin, which destroys both body and soul. An elder said, In our times, monasteries are saved through temptations, for virtues are attained when one resists temptation. Those who can endure all of the devil's temptations will be like one of those fathers of the past, provided he can endure to the end of his life. This means that patience without complaining is equal to the rule of prayer. A different ascetic elder said, Evil is everywhere, and darkness prevails. It resembles a newly plowed field with its dark soil turned over, and if you plant in it, seeds will soon sprout, and we will reap the fruit at harvest time. Hezekistic elder Joseph said, The main aim of the devil is to attack our faith. If the devil manages to make a person deny his faith, then he turns that person into a traitor. Father Daniel and I both had the same spiritual father. His name was Averkios, and he was like a second simple Paul. He was from St. John the Forerunner's cell. He had never left the holy mountain from the time he was a young boy. When he was brought to Mount Athos, hidden in a basket covered with onions, at the time, Greece was still under Turkish occupation. Father Averkios asked both of us to be his obedient monks. I will soon die, he said, and who's going to light St. John's oil lamp? Panagia will send you someone, I said. And then joking, I added, we are very difficult and you are strict. Actually, he was quieter than a little lamb. To this he replied, I will make a list on one piece of paper of what are the virtues, and on the other, what are the sins, and without saying anything to you, I will present them to you. What a blessed soul! He was blessed in two ways, first with simplicity, and second with respect for a person's free will. The hymnographer and elder Eurasimos, whom I greatly respected, a few years ago, he told me, St. Gregory Palamas says that only one thing is impossible for God, and that is to become one with an unclean person. Never happens. A Greek ascetic would take his craft, which was making brooms, to the Russian monastery of St. Pantolemon to sell them in exchange for dried bread. In this way he earned his daily bread through his labor. On the last days of his life we met the charismatic elder Simeon, who had been under obedience to Father Savas prior to that well-known elder's repose. Father Simeon told us many things about this virtuous and discerning man and also advised us, Be afraid of sinning, not of the devil, for he has no power. An old Hezekiah said, A novice obeys with piety without any questions. Later on he reasons, which destroys obedience. He examines through the eyes of logic. Hermit Christodoulos, who was under obedience to the watchful elder Kalinikos, the Hezekist, would say to us any time we visited him in his hut, In our days it is imperative to try harder to attain patience. In the past, saints labored hard for this virtue. We are unable to match their ascases, but at least we should try to have some patience, obedience, and humility. When I came to Mount Athos, I thought I had reached God. But after I met Elder Daniel, I realized how far away God was from me, said A. Moratides, a writer who later became monk Adronikos, a subordinate of the discerning elder. 
In 1968, my co-ascetic Father Daniel and I went to Karulia, the most remote desert of Athos, to see the admirable Russian hermit Elder Zosimas, a basket maker. With him was his subordinate, Father Seraphim, who had a little knowledge of Greek. He took us to their chapel honoring St. George, and in that desert we were offered three passages from the scriptures as spiritual treats. Quote, I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me. John 17, 6. And, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. John 1, 12. And, to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Matthew twenty eight twenty. Father Seraphim also said, We are going through difficult times. Soon the Antichrist will come. He will be of Jewish origin. We also visited the hermit elder Andreas in his poverty and illness. He was suffering from vertigo, but he was very patient. The following are two of the things he said. We ought to practice the teachings of the Bible, not just read it. In our prayer, our minds and hearts should be united. Restraint is a prerequisite for pure prayer. Do not judge your fellow man for anything. Exercise patience and obedience even to those who are younger than you. If you are 90, obey someone who is 18. Heavy but jolly, Elder Bartholomew also received us wholeheartedly with ascetic hospitality. Some of his sayings are these. Any time we have tears while praying, then we are in close contact with God. With our virtues, we resemble God. The Jesus prayer joins us with him. This is the way it is, my brothers. Woe is me that I have lost the blessing of synobitic life. Obedience leads to humility, mourning, tears, cleansing, and illumination. After he had treated us with one fig each, and some rainwater from his reservoir, he told us about the pious elder Isaac, the Dionysian, and all his virtues. Not long ago, I had a discussion with one of the fathers of Asket about the patience and obedience of the mules, which are used by the monks to transport heavy items through the steep, rocky paths of Mount Athos. These animals are good teachers for us, my brother, he said. They never complain, and they always wait patiently and blindly to obey. Another venerable monk, one who took care of all the working animals of the monastery, would say that mules do their duties with no complaints. They carry heavy loads of wood in rain or cold. If they are fed or not, no complaints. I, he continued, have been taught by these noble creatures. While feeding them, I have often wept as I compared my impoliteness to their gentleness, my disobedience to their obedience. Great hermit Daniel of Katanakia corrected and calmed a novice once, who had despaired because of scandals and annoying happenings in their monastery. He told the novice, Bear with the scandals, my son. No one is perfect. A very pious monk said to me, have we asked Panagia, she who is the keeper, lady, and overseer of this mountain, whether or not she approves of constructing roads on Athos, or using cars, noise, and engines, and having bureaucratic establishments within this monastic milieu? Is it possible that by all these things we ignore the Theotokos and all her promises for the holy mountain? A contemporary ascetic said, these days there is plenty of flour to make dough for bread, but no yeast with which to raise it. An Athenite saying goes, Be as cautious about taking a stranger into your monastic group as you would of adopting a stray cat. Tell me, what should be most careful about now that I am to be tonsured? A novice once asked blind elder Axentios the Gregorian whose life was totally devoted to prayer, which alternated between the Jesus prayer and the salutations to the Theotokos. Be deeply humble and avoid scandal, he replied. 
Monk Nicandros of Constantinitu was asked once, even though we daily read the biographies of saints and pious monks and do our rule of prayer, why don't we become like them? When a metal worker wants to apply pewter on copper, he answered, first he must scrape the copper clean and put it through fire. Unless the rust is removed, the pewter does not stick on copper. The same applies to us. We enter a monastery to become monks, but the rust we gathered while in the world comes with us. Thus, until it is removed, God's grace does not come to sanctify and make us shine. The revered Constantinitu Father Modestos would say, Make a point of not looking for other people's faults. Frequently, the monks on the holy mountain say, The way you live saves you, not the place where you live. Father Gabriel, I have one desire in my heart, and that is to come to Mount Athos to stay. Father Kirill, the respected elder of St. Nicholas Burazeri's cell, once said to the ever-memorable Kurulitan ascetic, Pay attention to what I am going to tell you, he replied. Indeed may you come, but since you are now in the world, go to your home, close the door, shut the curtains, fast, read, pray, use your prayer rope, and there you will be on the holy mountain. When he was speaking, his words were like fire, and his face was waxen and bright. This is the way a contemporary of the blind father Nikiforos used to tell about him. He lived in the Cenobitic monastery of Simonopetra many years ago. Father Nikiforos prayed the Jesus prayer unceasingly. He accepted ordination, but only in order to be obedient, and he prayed always to be freed from the awesome responsibility of the priesthood. His prayer was answered, and he was finally delivered when he lost sight. Confessor, Confessor Father G fell like a sharp axe on anyone who avoided work or was generally lazy. He advised the fathers to work and imitate the ascetics of old who labored hard. Some of them made baskets, some would gather bales in the field, some made oil from seeds, others would climb Athos to gather mountain tea to sell for their livelihood. One elder said, Our salvation is not a matter of chance, but a matter of hard work on our part. The kingdom of God comes to those who force themselves. Chapter 14 On God-Advised and Christ-like Works of Charity Kurulitan father Christophoros was very strict on himself. He used to slap his own face, for example, to stop himself from falling to sleep during vigils. He was charitable to the poor. Each time he met a monk or a lay person, he would bow down before him, touching the ground. In just the same way he bowed before beggars, monks, and the faithful alike. These are Christ's brothers and sisters. They are Christ himself, he would say. A venerable monk once said, Memorial services should be especially given for uncharitable persons after they die, and one should especially give alms in their memory, and again more alms. There are many poor people to help. Give to them. In memorial services, use plain koliva, not a sweetened version of it, as is being done so often of late. The ever-memorable elder Chrysanthos from St. Anne's used to tell us, Father Nectarios was so charitable that he would have given even the walls of the cell of the Holy Forerunner as alms to the hermits and to the Christians who were enslaved by the Turks. Father Nectarios's virtue was known only to Father Azarios, who one day, while he was digging in the garden, told me, Do you know what he does? Each day after Vespers, he visits the hermits and gives them whatever he has. Father Nectarios must have had the premonition that his life would end in martyrdom. He had a compatriot, Elder Kirill, who wished to follow his example and died the same death. This is the story of their martyrdom. At the time of the massacre in Ismarin, the Turks herded all the priests and monks together and confined them in a ravine. The nuns, having read of prophecies of just such an event, had fled away earlier, crossing to the island of Chios and Lesvos. All the captives were afraid of dying except Elder Nectarios, who consoled them all with these words. 
we have abandoned the world since our youth, and now with God's blessing we are given the opportunity to die as martyrs, and we are afraid? Let us repent and confess our sins and we will be freed from this fear of death. With these words, he persuaded them to make their confessions. Thus they regained their composure and bravely ended their lives as martyrs for Christ, killed by Kemal's soldiers. Only one here monk was miraculously saved. Once during a vigil at St. Fotony of Ilisos, he told me exactly what had happened during the massacre and then added, You see what charity does to someone? Charity is the crown of all virtues. Because Elder Nectarios had this virtue to the utmost, he had the courage to become a martyr for Christ. The ever-memorable Elder X would tell us, the well-known Father Minas, the Mavrovunian, was a very charitable man. All monks in his group ate from one large bowl. At the beginning of the meal, he would pretend to be eating, and then after he saw that the others had had enough, he would finish what was left in the bowl. Have you had enough? he would ask. Yes, would be the answer, without their realizing that he had eaten only one spoonful of food. Only a few as charitable as the monk Harlambos from the Dormition cell of St. Anne's. This elder's charity surpassed all his other virtues, that of ceaseless prayer, church attendance, and the memory of death. He died in 1945. Monk Eulogios, who we have mentioned previously, through his ascases and virtues, had received an abundance of grace and strength from God. He was so famous for his discernment and spirituality that many went to him for advice and guidance in their monastic life, and also to find comfort and to receive his blessing. He had a special concern for the poor, who found affectionate care near him. He constructed a separate building for them, where they could have a permanent shelter from which to offer their voluntary labor whenever possible to show their gratitude for his care. I once met Elder Christodoulos, who was under obedience to the great vigilant Elder Kalinikos. He received me as a guest in his hermitage in Katanakia, which was named for St. Eurasimos. This blessed monk took care of many of the poor by feeding them and giving them clothing and consolation. He would say, You must take care of strangers so that they will remain pleased. The blessing of lay people is important when they say, God bless and forgive you, Father. To have the virtue of charity is a great thing, and God blesses especially those who practice it. Don't hesitate to give always whatever you can. I have tested all this. Any time I receive goods from pious Christians, I share them with others. Are we beasts to eat everything ourselves? The following incident demonstrates his special virtue. On the day of his funeral, a beggar came with a full knapsack on his back. May I see Father Christodoulos? to ask for a blessing, he queried. Are you looking for charity in these impoverished places? They asked in reply. What do you mean? God bless him for all that he has done for me. He gave me money, canned goods, spaghetti, and even clothes. I've been coming here for many years, and he knows me. But this elder has died, they told him. What do you say? God have mercy on his soul for all he has done for me, and he depart departed very sad. Father Christodoulos was a perfect type of simplicity and love, of love in practice and of charity. The Romanian ascetic E had nowhere to lay his head. He was a helper who served at the meal line in the Russian monastery, and whatever he was given to eat there, he would offer as alms to the hermits who lived in the remoter areas. This is my chance to be saved, he would say, to humble myself by begging, to labor, and to give. Elder Artemios, when he was serving in the Grigoritian Metokian in Arta, would return empty-handed from his shopping for the monastery because he gave away all he had to the poor and elderly. Whenever Elder Haji Georges received gifts as thanks from persons who were cured through his prayers, he would give them in turn to monks, to the poor, and to lay people. He was so generous that to describe someone who was charitable, people would say, he gives like a Haji Georges. Once a monk asked his visitors, what is your occupation? Elder, our profession is not very good, they replied. 
hesitantly. We are merchants. My brothers, he said, these days we are in need of good businessmen. Now truly tell me, what do you do when prices are up on things? Do you sell the old merchandise you had in your store with the new prices? Yes, elder, we do. How can we manage otherwise to bring new stock into our store? That is correct, but this way you profit twice. You cannot sell using the old prices because the other merchants will react to that, but you could use the extra profit you gain toward deeds of charity, he said. Small in stature but tall in virtue was Father Antonakis, a hieromonk from Nuskeet, who was the celebrant priest in St. Anne's Metochian of the Taxiarchis in New Helvetia, Athens. Any time he was told of someone poor in his parish, he would go secretly to leave alms at that person's door. He did the same thing as his contemporary elder Eronimos the Simonopetrin and St. Nicholas, the Bishop of Myra in Lycia. Chapter 15 On Various Pious Monks Venerable and aged elder Yoasaf, known for his hospitality, was an established iconographer and a member of the Yosefites in Kiriaz. He told us, I have met many fathers who labored endlessly to purify their inner world and be saved. Among them, I have known the following. Elder Harlambos of Great Restraint, from the Fountain of Life, Kelion. Elder Methodius, from St. Nicholas's Kelion, known for his voluntary exile. Very simple, Elder Simeon the Chanter. Mild father, Dionysios, from the Holy Kelion over the entrance of the Theotokos. Elder Harlambos, the poorest and most simple of all. Constamanitu monk Philaratos, the lantern maker, who never left Manathos. Elder Arsenios, the woodcarver, noted for his silence and piety. Russian monk Lavrentios, frugal and self-restrained. Elder Dom Dometios, known for fasting. Father Neophytos, the ever-charitable, unceasingly praying all night long. Father Nicodemus, the meek and mild, the good shepherd. The Romanian ascetic who had the birds eating out of his hand. Elder Pacomios, one of the Pacomian iconographers who was a supporter of the Kolovadis and the traditionalists. Monks Averkios and Harlambos, the most charitable elders. The ever-memorable monk Joachim, who, whenever I met him, would tell me all about the many virtuous Aguritan fathers. Finally, possessionless, Elder Cosmas the Silent. In the Russian monastery of St. Pantolemon lived many hard-working monks. Elder Serapion, who fed only on bread and water. Elder Sabinas, who for a total of seven years did not sleep on a bed. Elder Dositheus, who was always exact in following the rules. Elder Anatolios, blessed with the gift of repentance. Elders Savinos and Seraphim, who had met St. Seraphim of Serov. In the holy skeet belonging to the holy monastery of Xenophantos lived pious fathers, Father Akakios, who had no evil in his heart. He had very little schooling. He would read passages from the Bible to his guests, thus avoiding idle and empty talk. He died in 1927. Also strict was Elder Chrysogonos, who died in 1943. In a hut suitable for goats lived an ascetic by the name of Elder Euthemios. He had hung in the middle of his hut a sack full of toasted bread, which was his daily food. The simple, century-old elder Gregorios lived on Manathos for 80 years. He died not long ago. He was born in 1890 and had come to the skeet when he was 18. He had met the monk Moratides, and he was closely associated with the hermit Amvilek and the discerning elder Daniel the Katanakian. His father confessor was Elder Akakios. We frequently enjoyed his unpretentious, childlike, and serene company. One time he brought a book by Elias Miniatis and read to me a chapter on the elevation of the Holy Cross. As he read, his eyes filled with tears, this aged elder. It was a sight worth seeing. He felt as if he were standing at the foot of the Lord's cross. In Kafso Kaliva's skeet lived many important monastics. 
some distinguished for their virtues and others for their formal education attained in the world, and some for both, all of which had become part of their Greek Orthodox soul. Among these were Ioannis, a disciple of St. Akakios from Caso Calivia, who reposed in 1665, Pelagios, a subordinate of Ioannis, who slept in the Lord in 1754, Raphael, Neophytos of Jewish descent, who was a wise teacher, Eugenios Vulgaris, who was in charge of the Athonadi school on Manathos, Theocritos Karatsas the Byzantine, who died in 1777, the long-bearded Methodius from Byzantium, who reposed in 1811, Philotheus from Ismarine, who reposed in 1789, Monk Petros, who labored in the birth of the Theotokos cell and died in 1865, the famous Nicodemus, the confessor, a subordinate to Arsenios, the great woodcarver, who left behind two legendary carvings, the crucifixion and the second coming, for which he spent 15 years' work to finish, and Pavlos and Pantolaemon, the spiritual fathers, both of whom were discerning and charismatic, serious and silent, sweet and mild when they had to advise anyone. Father Yermanos Cher tells us the following about the Kafsokalivitan fathers, whom we respected greatly. They would stand up during all-night vigils, resembling steadfast pillars, always keeping their eyes turned to the ground. The church had many such elders. They were all silent. They did not waste time with idle talk. They kept with exactness their spiritual life. The one who shone more than the rest of them was his illuminated life was Elder Auxentius. He resembled a star. He lived in the Kellyan of the great martyr St. George. He used a clay urn in which to boil wild greens, the only food he had to live on regularly. Sometimes he ate bread also, but nothing else. He lived in the skeet for approximately 60 years. In St. Basil's most remote skeet lived the great laboring fathers who accomplished notable ascetic victories and gained deep spiritual life like vigilant Father Barnabas, a teacher of the Jesus Prayer, and the Romanians Martinios, Ionos, and Theophylactos. Most of them were wood carvers. They made combs, spoons, and letter openers. Elder Martinianos lived entirely on the charities of the other monks, and he always re was ready to give thanks for what he received. God bless, what is your name and your parents' names? He would ask for the names in order to pray for them. Elder Ioannis was a man of letters. He was a graduate of the Polytechnic Institute, and he did many important trans translations in the quiet, purple desert atmosphere of St. Basil's. He translated two Romanian books by St. Nicodemus the Hagiorite, as well as other patristic works. Chapter 16 On the Energies of Divine Grace We once asked an elder, how can a person receive divine grace? One cannot receive divine grace unless he endures all temptations as they come, he replied, and then added, The greatest obstacle that obstructs God's grace is self-love. When God finds one's heart emptied of all desires, he fills it with his grace, which is impossible to describe. It can only be experienced in one's heart, but even a moment's sinful thoughts can make this grace withdraw. When the athlete of asceticism, the hermit Petros, who labored in the cave of St. Peter the Athenite, felt God's grace in his heart, he would exclaim, The Lord hit me with the javelin of mercy. An elder said, People of today do not have God's grace, and if they sometimes have a little bit of it, they cast it away. Then the demons stay with them. Bad thoughts obstruct divine grace. No ascesis is as powerful as good thoughts. Good thoughts come only to those who see everything through cleansed eyes. A contemporary venerable hesychist would say to me, Not many people are graced these days. Frequently we remain empty of God's grace. Then, through a sorrow or difficulty, it comes back to us again. An elder said, Many times our prayers are not answered because of us. Other times it is because of someone else and for a different reason. For example, someone asks me to pray for a person who is ill. 
I pray and let's say I have sufficient faith and I'm not egotistical. Still, God does not answer my prayer because the other person is not humble enough. He may believe that God will help, but his ego stands in the way. We must trust God. We should let him do whatever he wills. If I pray correctly, I may feel the removal of the temptation and everything will go well. Any time, however, that God allows us to go through a temptation, it is for our own benefit. And we should probably not ask God to deliver us from that difficulty. If the difficulty is caused by the devil, then God helps us right away. Many times God's will is unknown to us. An ascetic once asked, How is it that many times we don't feel anything when we pray, either in church or privately somewhere else? He answered, There are many possible reasons. Sometimes you may feel deep compunction, or you may sense that the Lord has given you a sweet consolation, though not as a result of your own labor. Then, because you did not understand these things, he takes them away until you understand. There is always a purpose to these things. In any case, do not strive for the gift of tears while praying, or for any other spiritual gift for that matter. The silent suffering within a person for some sin done in the past is the best gift. Forced tears in prayer can be dangerous because they can create illusions about one's spiritual state. Tears give rest. A deep sigh many times could be worth. I'm not sure. This is only my thought, and I might be wrong. Such a deep sigh might be worth more than a basket full of tears. We should not ask God for the gift of tears. Rather, we should ask him for repentance over and over again. We need repentance. The ever-memorable elder Lazarus, the Dionysian, told us the following incident, which was an experience of his own. He had just been tonsured, and one day as he was reading the salutations of St. John the Forerunner, standing before St. John's awesome icon, he was filled with such grace in his heart that he felt himself elevated above the ground and his whole body filled with unspeakable bliss. Another time when he was praying about a very serious matter to him, before this same icon of the forerunner, he heard St. John the Baptist say to him, Go to the chapel of the holy unmercenaries and be hesychistic. Father Lazar, Lazarus was indeed has been praying about this very thing because he had the desire to be a hesychist outside the monastery in a small hut near the forest. <laughs>